team of 2023. We are drawing to, and I think we must uh, endeavor to work very hard. Um, so the purpose of our meeting, if we can just have the agenda of fresh air is Good morning, Honorable. Good morning, Maybe we need uh, to add the, the lenses of uh, Andre. <laughs> yeah, he didn't see you. My apologies, I captured him because I to mention it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, yeah, so you're welcome to the meeting. Um, let us hear if there are any apologies, uh, Mr. Sermons. Chairperson, there's an apology, Mr. Cuthbert will, will be joining later. Chair. He's just attending a, a medical um, a matter. He's attending to Chair, so he will join us shortly. Thank you very much. That's the only apology? That's correct, Chair. Okay. okay. Can we have a move and a seconder for the adoption of this agenda? So the agenda consists of the briefing by the competition, uh, sorry, the company's tribunal and then the ECIC on the first and second quarter performance for the 2022-2023 financial year. So can I just ask for a move and a seconder? I see Honorable Burns, Mamashe Sand, and Honorable Motau. Chairperson, uh, I move uh, for the adoption of the agenda. Thank you very much. Honorable Motau. Thanks, Chair. I second the adoption of the agenda. Thank you very much. Uh, our, our agenda is duly adopted. Um, so the purpose of the briefing from, from the company's tribunal and the ECIC performance for the first and second quarter of 2022 to know that the committee can um, assess the performance of these national departments against its required of the money procedure and related matters act of 2000 and uh, Mr. 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 will be Ms. Matmila and Mr. Ms. Matoboche. Uh, Ms. Matumela, can I hand over to you to introduce the two entities and then we proceed? Thank you, Chairperson, and apologies for, for the delay. From the company's tribunal side, Chairperson, we've got the COO, Ms. Monica, Monica Lediwana. Uh, I'm just trying to check if the chair of the tribunal is in the, is in the room, but the chair uh, is Judge Dennis Davis, and I'm not sure if he's, he's, he's in the room, Chair. And from the ECIC side, we've got uh, Mr. Mandy Sengurtu, who's the CEO of the ECIC, and the chairperson uh, is also in the room, Mr. Devin Damalingham. Uh, we also have the GDG for the for the responsible branch chairperson, Ms. Lirato Matamo. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll take the uh, company's uh, tribunal first, and we therefore hand over to the COO. COO. You can share your presentation and proceed. Can we check the committee? 
Good morning, Chairperson. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Good morning. Good morning, um, Chairperson. Um, the Chairperson of the Tribunal, um, Judge Dennis Davis. Um, I can't see him immediately on the platform, uh, but he should be joining us. Um, so with your permission, Chairperson, um, so that I don't waste the committee's uh, time, uh, may I proceed? Yes, you may proceed. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Chairperson, and good morning to you again and to the members uh, of the Portfolio Committee. My name is Monica Lidingwani, um, and the team from the Companies Tribunal today uh, will be uh, Judge Dennis Davis, who's the chairperson of the uh, tribunal, and myself, Malitata uh, Monika Lidingwani, and the CFO of the institution being Ms. Holisani Bridget Ramakhad. Um, and um, the chairperson, where he on the platform, um, he would have made some brief remarks about the appointment of the uh, uh, tribunal members. And because um, he's not here, I will make them on his behalf for now. Um, I think he'll greet once he has joined us. Um, um, the tribunal members uh, were appointed um, on the, um, at the end of the year last year, after the end of term, of the, um, the previous members. Um, I understand that the judge has joined us uh, and if it is in order with you, uh, please chairperson, I'd like for him to do the introductory remarks. Thank you, uh, Judge Davids. Welcome to the meeting. I see you've rejoined the platform. You may address the portfolio committee. Uh, hello. Yes, we can hear you. I see that your name. Hello. Uh, we can hear you. Sorry, it's a shocking. Yes, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Just as you have switched off your video. I think uh, we'll yes, close the I'm having great deal of difficulty. Okay. Uh, for not being able to attend, I was appointed to this task. Uh, and I wasn't aware until very late. And I'm got a rush long time. But, but I wonder if us and I want to just might be how the financial I'm learning myself because the last two get my speed on this perfectly competent competent to deal with that just make uh, two or three points if I am um, side judge Davis. Um, I inherited judge Davis, I wonder if we can give you an opportunity yeah. to find a, a spot where you have better reception. We're hearing every second word you are saying, and I don't think it will do. I'm sorry, I've got a shock. No, I've got a turn. I don't know. I'm also here. Um, I, I Hello. I don't know, members, whether we can do anything else. I want to appeal to, right. to leave Judge to Davis. Yes, I think what you can do is to sub submit to the committee your opening remarks and any points of emphasis you wanted to make so I that would, it can I, you be read get... into the minutes. Che, che. Yes. You can, if you can hear me, I will certainly have to you by tomorrow. 
Thank you very much. Right. Can I hand over back to the COO to proceed with the oh, presentation? Sorry about this. Thank you. Yes, sorry, we Chair. Apologies. Yes. Chief. Yes. Yeah, I, I would like to maybe suggest that if at some point Judge Davis is able to find oh. a better connection, yes. maybe if we could give him that opportunity, because I'd be very interested to hear yeah. about what he found um, okay. uh, when, when, when he arrived. I think he was about to dive into that, and I think Speak that would be that, very yes. useful to, to hear from Judge Davis. So if he is maybe later, it improves, can we give him that opportunity to come back? Yeah, okay. That's fine. Uh, Judge Davids, have you heard, heard that proposal from Honorable McPherson? Okay, I think if the team from the company's tribunal can inform him and um, then we'll see when, where he is and where they can then make those introductory remarks. Thank you. Back to you, COO. Thank you, Chairperson. We shall inform the judge. Um, I am aware, though, uh, that he is engaged for the rest of today, um, so I doubt that he'll be able to rejoin. Uh, and because of that risk, maybe I should just mention the important things that he would have mentioned, apart from the introduction of himself. Um, um, he would have mentioned that the term of the previous members, panel of members, ended in September 2022, and that new members were appointed uh, end of December 2022. And this means that uh, for a period of about three months, uh, the tribunal was without a panel of members, uh, but the impact of this will be reflected in the report that we will be tabling tabling for the third and the fourth term when we next report to, um, to the committee. Uh, the members have been appointed for a five-year term uh, as from the December of 2022. It is a total of 11 members that have been appointed, um, being chaired, as we've already mentioned, by the judge himself. And uh, after a very long time, we this time around have a deputy chairperson by the name of Ms. Maina Tong Mongalo. Um, it is a total of um, 11, as I've mentioned, of the members of the uh, tribunal appointed. Seven of them are males and four are females. Um, and um, the members have, by the end of um, January, they had received a two-day induction and now we have started to allocate the backlog of cases that we had for them. Uh, but these are the details that we will be uh, tabling before the committee um, at the end of the fourth term when we next report. Uh, I thought we thought that we would just give you a heads up with regard to that one. And um, on the structure uh, of the presentation chair, um, we will be following what is listed there on the table of contents. Um, we will talk to the organogram. We will remind the committee about the benefits of the tribunal services. Um, and we will give you a sense around the number of cases that we are handling and our APP outputs. And uh, number nine, we will go to financial summary and we will end with the challenges chain. Uh, but we will be following that table of contents. Okay, before you proceed, can I just take the hand of uh, member Burns Mamashi? Honorable Mamashi? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I, I, I thought, Chair, uh, let me just uh, check something. Uh, I, I think the presenter intimated uh, that uh, due to technical glitches, uh, which have actually made it uh, a bit impossible for the judge uh, to make uh, his uh, uh, remarks uh, when uh, Honorable McPherson uh, requested that uh, if uh, for any other reason he, the glitches are sorted and is able to address uh, the portfolio committee, it looks like. Uh, we may not find him uh, because he's busy with other things. I wanted to check that because I had thought that 
uh, he shall have prepared himself to be part of this meeting until uh, the end of the uh, session uh, that would deal with issues of the uh, Kambani's tribunal. Uh, am I correct to assume that uh, he is still part of the meeting or the presenter is suggesting that uh, he is now attending to other matters more important than the work of the portfolio committee? I think the judge uh, would have spoken to that. Um, and I think we will hear from him when he joins the, when he rejoins the meeting. Uh, but I'm not sure whether it's the CEO's second in command can speak on that, uh, that um, matter. But I think we, we take the point that you are making in terms of um, the, the, the lead person, the chairperson of the tribunal uh, being available for a portfolio committee meeting. COO? Yes, uh, thank you, Chairperson. Um, I think this is perhaps where the Chairperson was um, of the tribunal was breaking up uh, quite a bit, so maybe members couldn't hear him. He already um, tendered an apology to say that he will not be able to be um, in the committee throughout. We had also indicated this um, when we sent through our presentation to say that the judge will be logging on to introduce himself, introduce the team, um, and really basically greet, uh, but that he would not be able to stay in the session throughout. Uh, so we had indicated it initially, but the judge himself did mention it uh, at the time that he was talking, except he was breaking up a bit, so members probably didn't hear him. So maybe I should just have re-emphasized that point when I began, but I thought that he was all right. And the recent chairperson, maybe I should add, is that um, having joined the institution a bit late, um, he uh, is struggling a little bit to fit in to his uh, already existing schedule. Uh, some of the appointments and meetings that we have uh, for the tribunal. So unfortunately, this one clashed uh, with the commitment that he already had. Um, and at some point we had made an proposal for perhaps a shifting of the or swapping with another entity, but we understood that it really is a long process and we asked that it be left where it is. So we apologize for this chairperson, but he is not able to be with us throughout the meeting. Okay, thank you very much for that explanation. If members agree, we can proceed and then just, um, I think we must make an op we must create an, a space where the the chairperson of this tribunal can come and address us as the portfolio committee. Can I just see uh, members if we are in agreement that we proceed, or should we reschedule? Honorable Burns, Lamashe. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, uh, I think my, my, my concern was around uh, creating uh, some sort of a difficult uh, precedent to um, deviate from. Uh, when uh, meetings of the portfolio committee are scheduled, the expectation is that uh, entities reporting to the portfolio committee would uh, make the necessary pre uh, preparations and be led by uh, appropriate uh, authority uh, to lead uh, the proceedings in respect of the department. Uh, the expectation is that the department would be led by uh, the minister in the absence of the minister, the deputy minister, and in respect of public entities, it's important that, uh, especially the, the chairperson, it being the first uh, engagement with the portfolio committee, it would have been ideal. Uh, but as I say, if perhaps uh, everything that uh, is necessary uh, for presentation is part of that which will be presented, we may uh, make that exception, but uh, with a very clear note 
that uh, going forward, we want to make sure that uh, those uh, in whose authority uh, of, 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 of the accounting authority is uh, um, uh, put in their hands, they must prioritize uh, the work of the portfolio committee. I, I think that should be the underlying um, uh, principle. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we all agree with uh, what you have. I don't see any hands, so I'm assuming that there is agreement on what you have said. We will give the judge an opportunity to present his opening remarks, and then we as a portfolio committee can make a decision on when we will call this entity back, maybe not for a, uh, a, a financial and non-financial um, present a report presentation, but for a general discussion uh, based on the availability of the chairperson. Um, I think CLO, you can proceed. I don't see further hands. Chair, my hand is up, sorry. Oh, sorry, I see, yes. Honorable, um, uh, Honorable um, Mbuyani. Thank you very much, Chairperson. I think I'm audible. We're having serious challenges of network. Uh, yes, but really, yes, but really I am concerned about uh, uh, the double booking of, 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 of the judge here because he was supposed to be here until such time then. I don't know why we have to reschedule for the judge to come back here because we hear that that he found in the process and what is it that we need to assist with. So if the judge is not here today, uh, I don't know if we can reschedule him alone to present in the, in the committee. Uh, but really we are concerned that the judge could not be part of us. Uh, even if he can just present and do whatever he has to, to do in the committee, then he will leave. But now we're not hearing anything from the judge, whether the judge is able to work or not. Thank you, Che. Yeah, I think the problem that, that uh, what you are proposing or what you are, are, are speaking on would have happened if the judge had a better uh, network. But obviously all of us could see that it was red and his connectivity was, was very, very poor. And, and therefore I stopped him because I couldn't hear what he was saying, just hearing every, every few words. Sure. So um, if we are in agreement, Honorable Motau. Honorable Burns, Namashi. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Maybe uh, what will assist us uh, is uh, taking into consideration the comments that were intimated by the COO. Is there any written apology to the portfolio committee uh, to the extent that uh, the judge will only uh, make his uh, introductory remarks and be excused for the better part of the session of the committee. Um, okay, I think, Chair, I think- Chairperson? Yes, thank you, Mr. Hermans. I was just asking you to indicate whether there was an apology, because it wasn't read when we were uh, dealing with apologies. Um, Chair, just, I just want to indicate that the, that the changes to the program wasn't due to, to, to was a parliamentary change. We were supposed to schedule we were supposed to meet with the um, company tribunal yesterday, but because of a parliamentary change to a their program, our program had to change. So the judge was scheduled to, to meet with the committee on the 14th of February, but because of the change to the parliamentary program, committees were requested not to meet and that impacted on the judge and we just moved. So that, that, that is where the, the challenge came in, started already. So it was due to a parliamentary program change, Chair, that, 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 we would, that the judge would have been there yesterday, but because of the parliamentary change, we had a full sitting since 10 o'clock yesterday morning, we had to make these adjustments, Chair. I just thought I'll indicate that 
to the committee chair. Thanks. Thank you very much for that explanation. Honorable McPherson. Um, Chair, yeah, it's, it's, it's clear that there's no malicious or sort of sleight of hand um, by, by, by anyone in this. And, you know, I mean, I mean, also, you know, knowing the various committees that Judge Davis sits on, from the Tax Commission to, to various other entities that he chairs, um, you, you know, one can, you know, also, uh, you know, appreciate that, like many of us, you know, sometimes our schedules are difficult to change. And where there was a change in the parliamentary program, I think we need to accept that at face value. However, what I do think would be helpful, um, and 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 I think that the judge was, uh, you know, alluding to, you know, or getting to the space that I, that I was going to find very interesting as to sort of what he had found or what they had to pick up with. And we all know the challenges of the company's tribunal previously, and um, that you know I think it would be helpful not only for us but for himself as the chair to be able to have a full meeting where he can, you know, appreciate also some of the concerns that we have been able to have and we can have a full interaction through the meeting. And, and maybe it might be a prudent, uh, at, uh, obviously at your discretion, that we try and seek an opportunity where we can have a full meeting um, uh, with, uh, with Judge Davis to be able to partake in the whole meeting um, which I'm sure that, you know, if enough notice is provided, he will gladly do so. And I think it would be beneficial to both the, the, the committee and to, uh, and to the new team to be able to have that full uh, and, and, and fruitful in engagement. Uh, but uh, I leave that to your consideration. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, members, for your input. I will apply my mind and uh, give notice of what uh, how we will proceed going forward. Um, so for now, I'm going to ask the COO to give us the report uh, uh, on the first and second quarter financial and non-financial performance, and then I will apply my mind to the other matters at hand as suggested by the committee. Thank you. No, no further hands, because I don't want to interrupt the CEO, I think, for the 10th time. Thank you. I see uh, Honorable Burns Mamashe, is your hand is still up? Did you want to make um, additional comments? No, I, I, I think it's the leg that's the hand, Chef. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, COO, please proceed. Um, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairperson. Um, I was on um, slide number one on page six. Um, and on this slide, we have the organogram uh, of the institution. And at the bottom of the organogram, you'll see the legend, which basically says that the blue is the positions that are currently filled and the um, green is funded but vacant positions, which we don't have currently. And that the red, which is where the judge sits, is positions that are not full-time in the organization. Um, it is a, an organogram that we have shared with members of the portfolio committee before, so it's a familiar one. All I need to highlight on this one is that the total number of staff that we have is 14. Uh, of the 14, six of them are ladies and we have eight men. Um, and on the structure currently, as we report, we have all African in terms of race. We did have um, a person of um, different race, but who just left the institution recently. Um, so we will be working on those issues so that we are properly uh, representative. Uh, and during the quarter that we are reporting on, we had one intern who is at the moment acting in a different position. Um, and <clears throat> just anticipating some of the questions that members might have on the structure, uh, we thought we would highlight the fact that the structure was approved uh, in November 2018, uh, but as you can see, there are several vacancies on the structure. The reasons for the structure not being fully implemented as in the sense of warm bodies being put in the positions was due to financial limitations. 
Uh, but in addition to that, in the year, I am now on slide uh, number two, which is on page seven. Uh, but in addition to the financial limitations, in 2016, 2017, um, the tribunal started to um, experience some decline in the number of cases being received. Um, as you can see on the little diagram that I've put there below uh, point number three, I give you a sense of this decline. Um, and I will not be going through it one by one, but as you can see, in 2016, 2027, we had a decline of about 105 cases. So we went down. Um, and in the following years, we were declining by any number between uh, 21 and 18. We started to make um, a turnaround uh, in 2020 and 2021, uh, where we reversed the downward trend and gained one number. But last year, we had a significant increase in the number of cases, uh, which came to a difference of about 87 number of new applications that we received. But we had also not been reporting on the appropriate dispute resolution cases, and we've now started to include it. The reason really, um, in our mind, uh, for this increase, uh, which is very welcome, um, to us is because of the increased marketing efforts uh, that we started to fund and started to immerse ourselves largely in. Um, so, but um, also what is important to note with regard to the structure is that um, during, um, immediately after the, um, the, the introduction of that new uh, organogram, the members uh, needs changed. We used to do research for members and even did recommendations for them, and they no longer required that. Uh, and as a result of the financial constraints and as a result of the change in the needs of members, we therefore deprioritized the feeling of positions and we prioritized uh, higher on the list, the marketing of the tribunal, um, and we started to fund it more and more. Hence, we see the change. Uh, but I think it was logical, um, if I can put it that way to us, that with a declining number of cases, um, it was no longer that important to increase the number of staff. We found that we could still cope uh, with the structure not being fully implemented because of the decline in the number of cases. But as I said, the initial reason why it was not fully uh, filled was because of financial constraints. Um, so the changes in the members uh, needs um, then became secondary in terms of deprioritizing uh, the filling of positions. Uh, what we started to do was really to adapt a system of reprioritizing. We would from time to time look where the most pressing needs were in terms of the positions that the tribunal had and would fund that particular position. In one case, when it appeared to us that the research position was not that important as members did not need research anymore, we then um, uh, defunded that uh, position and funded other positions. Um, I do need to mention that currently the structure is under review uh, and that in the coming month, we might have the final outcome of this. And this is mainly because uh, from our interaction with the members, uh, we have also determined that they will behave in different, slightly different needs as compared to the last group of members that we had. But uh, apart from that, we had also uh, detected a bit of misalignment with the needs in the light of the growth that we have in the institution. And so for those reasons, we are reviewing the structure. Uh, the next slide, which is on page eight, uh, with slide number three, talks to the matters that members of this committee are fully aware of, which is when it is that we were established, what our mandate is, which is really adjudication and dispute resolution. It talks to our vision, 
to be the prevent um, adjudicatory and alternative dispute resolution forum. And it gives you a brief of um, uh, the number of members that we have um, that we have already alluded to. The next slide, which is slide number four on page nine, reminds you again, members of the benefits that we have for um, in the tribunal, uh, the reasons why really this institution was first established. It was to uh, be cost effective in terms of litigation, to be able to deal with matters of company related dispute in a nimble and flexible manner. And uh, the ADR in the appropriate dispute resolution that we offer is one of those processes uh, that are best in terms of settling disputes in the sense that it is non-acrimonious, parties are in control of the outcome, and uh, when all is done, uh, parties can still continue to work together because of its non-acrimonious nature. The next slide, um, Chairperson, which is on page 10 and is slide number five, gives you a sense of the types of applications that we receive uh, from uh, um, extension of time to convene AGM and the variation of orders and so on. And it tells you where we get most of our cases. You can see a uh, name dispute as we have reported in the past still ranks very high. Um, and these are cases that have their genesis uh, from CIPC uh, in that they would have made decisions that members would uh, um, of the public or companies would not be happy with. And so they come to us uh, to um, review or look at these decisions again, especially around the names that would already have been approved by CIPC. So um, that number of cases is still the highest we have it is followed by director's dispute, uh, which we saw a rise in during the COVID period, especially uh, for some reason, people in companies seem to be having issues with each other. So we saw a rise in that one. Uh, the social and ethics com um, uh, committee um, is also one of the types of applications where we receive the most, um, the highest number. Um, in. So as you can see at the, at the bottom, we give you the total number of applications that we have been receiving over the years, uh, starting with 2015 um, to the last financial year. And that increase that I was talking about is also just demonstrated in the numbers. Um, you can see where we started to pick up uh, which is 2020, 2021. And um, as I mentioned, we have started to now include the number of ADR being appropriate dispute resolutions that we receive, which we haven't been reporting in the past. And that brings us to a total of 311 uh, cases that we dealt with in the uh, past financial year. Chairperson, the next slide, uh, which is slide number six on page 11, um, informs the members about uh, the two programs that we have, uh, which are part of our mandate, which is adjudication and to the support uh, program, which is administration. And we do say that in terms of our annual performance plan, what we do target in terms of program one is turnaround time. As you can see, in terms of issuing of decisions, uh, and this would be where there is an opposition, uh, the matter is disputed by another party, we want to take, and we do take 40 days uh, in terms of uh, cases where there's no dispute, we take about 30 days, and ADR, we take 25. Uh, so this is what we target. And by comparison, members would be familiar uh, with the courts processes and the turnaround times in the ordinary courts of the country and be aware that the turnaround, they are much longer. They can stretch anything between six months to a few years in terms of finalizing a matter. And so this is where we see 
um, our niche really and our advantage uh, for people to, um, to use us. It is advantageous in that we are able to complete cases within that short space of time. And program two um, really says what are the kind of program uh, activities uh, that we undertake to be able to support uh, the main program one on adjudication. We do research, we hold seminars, we do stakeholder engagement, and of course we do hiring as well to be able to support the achievement that we normally get at the end of the year in program one. Uh, moving on um, to slide number seven, which is on page 12. Um, here we give highlights uh, against the targets that we already informed you of, of the 40 days, 30 days, and 25 days. And we are showing you what our achievements were in the first and the second quarter. Uh, we mentioned here that against the target uh, of 95, both in quarter uh, one and two, uh, which is where we wanted to finalize 95% uh, of the cases that we receive um, and that are supposed to be finalized within 40 days. We wanted to finalize 95% uh, of them. We say that we achieved a target of 100%. So we achieved all of them. We finalized all of them. And in terms of quarter two, it was also a, a, a hundred percent achievement. In terms of unopposed matters that are supposed to be finalized within 30 days, we had a target of 95. Um, and as you can see, we did achieve 92 in quarter one, which was then below uh, um, the target. And in quarter two, we were right on target and on ADR, uh, we exceeded, we far exceeded our targets there. I do need to mention that our turnaround time is calculated as from the time that the matter is complete and ripe for hearing. So if the parties take a long time in terms of finalizing their applications, submitting the necessary documents, making the necessary corrections and whatever else that they need to do to get matter, the matter ripe and ready for hearing, we don't call, count, count that time as it is beyond our control. Uh, but we are increasing the number of staff members to be able to prompt uh, applicants and respondents to be able to uh, finalize their applications earlier. So that was um, slide number seven on page 12. I'm moving on to slide number eight uh, on page 13, um, where we mention that with regard to administration on the key highlights, um, in the light of the challenge that I will be highlighting later on, which is on the reusing number of applications that we are receiving. Um, we have started discussions on expanding our mandate in terms of Schedule 4 uh, with various entities of the DTIC and the Small uh, Business uh, Development Department as well. And we also, um, along the lines of marketing ourselves, uh, we have been we have been webinars with other sister entities within um, the DTI family. Um, and on the financial side, Chairperson, we have had um, a clean audit uh, for the fifth consecutive year. And um, in terms of um, cost containment, Chair, we have 100% compliance. And uh, during the quarters under review, we also managed to, to identify and properly manage our strategic risks. Um, and we had no irregular expenditure and were good in terms of payment to suppliers chain. Um, I move on to slide number nine, which is on page 14. And I will not be uh, going through those um, items uh, one by one. Just to mention that uh, this is the slide that gives you a sense of the number of applications that we are receiving, the new ones, it tells you in quarter one, we received 71 and in quarter two, we received 68 and the total 
at the end of those two quarters was 139. This is new cases only. The first line being applications brought forward. Um, it is a concern to us that number. Uh, this is the number of applications that is not being finalized and that is being moved from quarter to quarter. In the majority of cases, uh, the reasons for non-finalization is that the parties themselves are not playing the ball. They are not submitting the documents that they need to, or rather the um, statutory limits that we need to observe. In, the, in terms of the number of days that each party has to submit their own applications has not come to an end. Um, so this is an area that I have mentioned is largely uh, beyond our control. It's the parties that have to do the necessary filing, but we do think that there is an influence we can bring to bear on these numbers. And for that reason, on the new proposed structures, uh, we are having a proposal on the case management officer that will be able to work on these numbers to bring them down uh, to do the prompting that I talked about. Uh, apart from that, uh, the lower part of this um, table, which says pay application type, it tells you which cases we were able or how many cases we were able to finalize uh, per category or per type of application. I'll move on to um, slide number 10 on page 15, which is really just a graphic illustration of the, um, the cases that I've been talking to you about comparing quarter one and quarter two uh, and showing you um, again, which types of cases we are receiving uh, most of, uh, but comparing the two quarters. I move on. Uh, to page um, 16, uh, being slide number 11. Um, and this slide is now um, informing you uh, on the status of the applications, uh, which ones were still pending, and which ones had been decided, uh, which ones were withdrawn, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. So this is the types of um, status that the different applications would be at at the end of each quarter. Um, as you can see, the pending, which is the area that I highlighted as a bit of a concern to us, still has the majority uh, of cases. And where we mention on the total column that a uh, total is not applicable is because those kind of cases would have been moving from one quarter to another and um, counting them and adding them up would not give an appropriate uh, picture. So there's a repetition in the number of cases that would not be um, uh, finalized uh, in quarter one that would then move to quarter two. And as a result, you can't add up because there would then be a duplication. The ones that we are able to add up is where there is finality, which is cases that have been decided and cases that are withdrawn and cases that are closed. Uh, the others are uh, repetitive, so we're not adding up those numbers. ADR uh, proceeds the same way. We inform you of the applications brought forward from quarter to quarter. As you can see, considering that ADR, we also receive fewer applications. Uh, applications brought forward is also a high number, comparatively speaking, and it will also be that area that we will be working on in terms of getting that officer that will be prompting parties to be able to finalize quicker. New applications. Um, we went down drastically in quarter two in terms of ADR. ADR is quite a difficult field in that uh, people change uh, sometimes from one type uh, of process that they want to go through to another. Uh, sometimes an application can start as a adjudication, which means it would have been scheduled to be presented and be heard uh, before a member and then members sometimes change then and they want to do ADR. Other times they get to ADR and then they change their mind. They don't want to go ahead with it. Other times they submit applications 
uh, for ADR and the other party does not want to come to the table. And so that application will then be withdrawn. Uh, so that's why our numbers are a bit slow on ADR. But I think I need to mention that this is an area that the judge been the new chairperson is very interested in. He thinks that there are low hanging fruits here and he's got great ideas with regard to how uh, we can improve that. Um, he thinks that there is a lot of room and a lot of space for us to play. Um, and he will be sharing his ideas at a later stage. I just think it might be a little bit premature for me to mention them, but he has already shared with us some exciting ideas around how to pull in more applications and interest around appropriate dispute um, uh, resolution. And we're quite excited with his ideas. Okay, and then um, the bottom part, per application status, it just shows you um, the under ADR now this time around, which ones were finalized, how many were finalized, withdrawn, closed, and so on. Um, I move on to um, slide number 13, which is on page 18. And this is the support program uh, on stakeholder engagement. Um, this is part of the administration support program too that I spoke about. And I had already mentioned that one of the things that we did was to reprioritize funding and give more funding to marketing. And so our activities have really shot up in terms of marketing and stakeholder engagements. We had a target for outreaches uh, being community um, and sort of non-direct stakeholders that we engage from time to time. Uh, we take our direct stakeholders and the stakeholders that are relevant to our mandate uh, to be mainly um, the companies that are registered as it, these are supposed to be, or we're supposed to be focusing on their disputes to be the attorneys and the lawyers that help them um, to be the accountants and to be the, uh, the um, directors of companies and so on. And so when we, 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 we draft our engagement uh, plan, we focus on these stakeholders as they have a direct impact to us. But from time to time, we do realize uh, that we do need to engage communities, students, and people like that so that they have knowledge of the kind of work that we do so that at the appropriate time, they may also use our services or even share it with the people that might be relevant to use in the services that we offer. So this is where this um, target comes from. And it is a low one because we have received a criticism in the past uh, of engaging stakeholders that are not directly related to our mandate. But nonetheless, we had a target of um, uh, three outreaches, um, uh, we had a target of um, six, and we um, we achieved. We had a target of um, of three um, in quarter one, and we achieved six. And we had a target of two in quarter two, and we achieved three. In terms of the bulletins, we had a target of one and achieved exactly that in both quarters. Um, in terms of media engagement, we had a target of two in quarter one, and we achieved just that. The same with quarter two, we were on target with a target of three, where we achieved three. Um, we also have a program, an annual seminar um, that we uh, do in, in conjunction with mainly university universities at the end of the year. And uh, with regard to this for the quarters, because it's an annual program, for the quarters, we only just report on quarterly milestone. And our milestones for quarter one and quarter two were well achieved. We also have a research, which is an internal um, research topic that we come up with. It would be different from the research that I referred to, which we used to do for members. Uh, but here we identify a topic that is of importance to us 
um, and that we then, in conjunction with a, a university, uh, organize a seminar um, as a way of sharing knowledge, one, and two, as part of marketing. Um, so with regard to this, we can also report that the milestones that we had for both quarters uh, were duly achieved. On the um, HR, I've already um, informed you, I am now on page 21, being slide 16, um, on human resource that already talked to you about the, um, the, uh, the structure. And this is really just a summary of it. We said that we have 14 positions. At the end of quarter two, we had two uh, fields and two were still uh, vacant. But as we speak now, uh, we have a full complement, but that falls outside uh, the reporting period. We said that um, some of our highlights, uh, when I reported earlier on, I said that um, during the quarters under review, we were able to identify our strategic risks and uh, uh, continuing to manage them. And uh, these risks that I was talking about, there are five of them. The first one is really around inadequate funding, which we have reported to members of this portfolio committee before. It's a known challenge that we have. Uh, we know that we are not the only entity in this um, challenge, uh, but we nonetheless do believe that it is high enough, important for us to uh, flag it. So it is our risk number one. We're doing all we can within our means in terms of engaging with the shareholder, and as I mentioned, we reprioritize and so on with regard to um, improving and mitigating um, this risk. But we do think that the most important um, um, way to um, mitigate this risk is really an amendment of the current act. Um, and we've got ideas about how this can be done. We already proposed it for uh, before the uh, when this amendment act that is still the amendment act now bill now uh, was being muted, uh, but those um, inputs were not taken on board at the time. The reason being that the department wanted to do a light touch in terms of amendment of the act, and they are only now going to be doing extensive a detailed amendment of the act or at the later stage, whenever it is that they decide. But that round was not for detailed amendment. But at that time, we had already submitted that one of the amendments that we think can help us uh, with regard to funding challenges would be one um, to enable us to be able to raise our own funds through the charging of fees. And number two, uh, perhaps to be able to get a portion uh, of our activities, especially the ones that have um, their genesis from CIPC being funded by CIPC themselves. Uh, so those were some of the uh, uh, proposals uh, on the funding that we made at that time, which when the process for extensive amendments starts, we will be making again. Uh, and there are some other models of funding also that we are looking at that we will be proposing. Uh, but funding remains a challenge to us, um, as I believe it does for several other entities. Uh, there's also a reluctance with regard to the use of the tribunal, but this really explains why we've gone full out uh, in terms of, my, of marketing and why we have uh, prioritized marketing high on the list. And, and I put in more resources to it. Uh, and of course, I've already mentioned the, um, the ideas that the judge has around this. So uh, combined efforts will really help us um, to deal with this issue around reluctance of the public and companies to use the company's tribunal, uh, which by the way is a free service and we don't quite understand the reluctance. There's also the inability to develop a positive reputation and grow the institution. And see this you could see from the gently numbers that I highlighted uh, later on. And this is also where we're going out with um, increased marketing 
to be able to mitigate this um, risk. Uh, we also um, uh, do um, sense that we have a bit of a challenge with regard to recruitment and retaining competent and skilled personnel. And um, we have various means there to be able to, um, to mitigate this, this challenge, uh, which includes development of a resource plan um, and um, conducting employee engagement survey to establish where um, the, challenge, the challenges might be. Uh, we have had um, a few terminations in the uh, previous year. Uh, but those were due to um, the labor issues that we had um, and the GEPF matter that we have reported to this committee before uh, that resulted in some hearings and some terminations. Um, so when we talk about inability to recruit, we're not really referring to terminations that um, came about as a result of those special circumstances. Um, we also have challenges around um, IT, um, but we mitigate this through uh, backups and, and vulnerability tests uh, and security awareness. Uh, members, uh, as far as the non-financial information is concerned, um, that is our story. And I'd like to hand over with your permission, Chairperson, to the CFO, of the institution, Ms. Bridget uh, Hulisani uh, Ramakhadi, uh, to take us through the financial information with your permission, Chair. Thank you very much, CRO. Uh, over to uh, the CFO, Ms. Ramakhadi. <coughs> I think if you are in the same room with the CLO, then it's going to be a problem. CLO, are you ready? Uh, sorry, CFO, are you ready? Um, um, um. <laughs> I think you can switch off your. Um, you can switch off your camera. We've seen um, your <clears throat> We are ready. So, um, um, with regards to the financial information, our um, spending is um, <clears throat> going well. Um, we have already spent. Uh, we have already spent forty-four percent of the allocated budget um, at the end of the second quarter. And we have, uh, based on the forecast we made, we'll be spending the remaining uh, budget uh, um, in the next quarter. Um, we, we also received um, a, a budget, in, a baseline increase um, in the previous financial year, and that has um, assisted in improving the support and maintenance of our um, IT systems and also um, enhance the marketing activities the, the COO had referred to. Um, however, um, we still Sorry, have um, insufficient you're... funds to cover, to fill CFO. the vacant positions. Um, even with the uh, current re, uh, structure review that is um, underway. CFO. <laughs> because our, 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 budget, uh, our budget is growing very slow. Um, so we have the total budget of 24 million for the per annum, um, and that grows um, with um, a, a five percent, 4.5 percent um, annually over the MTF. Um, we if how can you hear me? So um, in in the over the two quarters, can I just ask, um, um, we, the have, we have received all what all, all the grants that we had anticipated, so we don't have anything um, as a, a pending. We've also in, received interest um, more than what we budgeted for, um, and that is mainly as a result of us. CLO? 
can can I ask you if the CFO can't hear me? Um, I can't share this with you if she can't hear me. There's anything. Kate, it would appear that um, the, CF, the CFO <laughs> can't hear you, Chair. Um, we, um, so we, we received more interest than what, what we had budgeted for. Um, and just this sort is just the yeah, effort this seems brief, um, right? on, on our financial uh, management. Mm -hmm. um, Chairperson, I, I, I think I missed um, something. Can you hear me now? If if I did not miss anything, you will allow me to continue. Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay. Um, okay, Chairperson, um, I understand that you wanted to speak to the CFO, but she couldn't hear you. Can you hear me now? Um. We are actually not able to hear anything if anyone is speaking. Can you turn so up I the might volume just on your device? On the other laptop, just to. Um, Chairperson, can you hear us now? Yes, we could hear you all the time. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes, now it's, yeah, I'm, I'm happy that you can hear me because I can't chair a meeting where the presenter can't hear me. And I wanted okay. to, yeah, to ask the, um, the CFO not to move around so much because she's like going away from the mic and coming back to the mic just to, so that we can finish the, the presentation. We are running out of time and we still want to have enough discussion. We will um, do so, Chair. Yeah. Thank Can you. I just, Thank just you. hold on? There's a hand from a member. Honorable Burns, from Not very much, I was just about to suggest that perhaps we adjourn, even if it's for three minutes, and allow Andre and them to sort out the glitches. As I agree with you, you can't chair a meeting with a presenter who cannot hear when you are talking. Okay, no, but it's Quite fine now. They can hear us, so we will later continue. Okay. Thank you, Honorable Member. You may continue, CFO. Thank you, Chairperson. <clears throat> so, um, can you um, go back to your presentation mode, please? Um, so, um, with regards to re revenue um, collection in uh, per quarter, um, we received um, 14 million in the first quarter and as we had uh, forecasted. Um, and in quarter two, there was no forecast, so we received nothing. And we also um, account for revenue in, in kind, which is the waived um, rent for the accommodation that we are using. So we account for that, we budget for that and have an accounting entry of 560,000 per quarter. And both of uh, entries went through in quarter one and quarter two. And um, with interest, we received 18,000 in first quarter and 148 in the second quarter. Um, and the, the increase is basically because once we receive the, um, the, trench, the trench from the uh, DTIC, we then invest it until at such time we need to use um, the funds. Um, <clears throat> as I've indicated, we spent 20% 20, 20 of, uh, of the budget um, in the first quarter. And in the second quarter, we, we've al we had already spent 44%. So um, uh, the second quarter marks the half of the year. So our spending is actually uh, going well and we are of the view that we will spend 100% at the end of the financial year. Um, um, the, the the graph also um, shows that our our spending is gr is growing gradually aligned to the month and um, and this is as a result of our main expenditure being the compensation of employee which is a, a, a fixed cost throughout um, the year um, the actual the, the <coughs> comparison between budget and actual. Um, 
you will see that we are under we are there is in all our expenses we are not overspending um with employee related cost um our budget was, was sitting at 7 million 7.9 we spent 7 million this is as a result of um a position two positions which were not filled um and um in the in in the coming quarters we are working on filling those positions so we will catch up on that expenditure and on operating expen operating expenses um the underspending is as a result of um properly managed um expenditure so we are, are gradually we are monitoring those expenditures to ensure that we don't end up overspending. Um, some of the um, another reason is the timing of the invoices, so we will be able to catch up with that. Um, and under administrative expenses, the the reason for underspending was mainly because of the purchase orders which were issued, but the work the work was done where was done the, so the funds are committed but we have not we have not been invoiced so we have not accounted for the expenditures um and um with tribunal members we were not overspending or underspending um so the 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 breakdown of our expenditure as i've indicated the the big portion goes to employee related costs uh, mainly because we are we're a service based organization and that is followed by the um, tribunal members fees and then operating expenses um and to date we've spent um 11.8 million um we did not incur any fruitless and wasteful expenditure in both quarter one and quarter two and we were able to pay our suppliers within the 30 days for both the quarters. And um, the, our designated procurement for the um, for uh, <clears throat> was at sitting at 70% in the first quarter, and um, second quarter it was at 75%. So this is where we focus on our socioeconomic imperatives, and um, we are doing well because our target was 60%. Um, per annum, and we we have been exceeding that. I will hand over to the COO to uh, talk to the challenges we currently have. Thank you, CFO. <laughs> Madam Chair, we are concluding now, and I'll be quick on these ones. We've already spoken to the funding and budgetary constraints to say that the tribunal has for many years been underfunded and we've reported this uh, variously to the committee. We've already also, and I illustrated uh, by um, a small diagram um, that I had at the bottom um, showing the number of cases that we are receiving and how they've been declining over the years. Um, the limited mandate, um, it is also a challenge that we report year in, year out, and we've already shared with you what our uh, views are with regard to improving uh, our limitations on the mandate uh, through amendments, and we've already suggested some amendments that can be made there. Um, case management system um, is an electronic uh, system that we um, introduced back in 2019 with a view to capturing cases that are received in the tribunal and managing um, the cases through the system in the sense of um, analyzing them and um, um, uh, checking them for compliance and sending them through the, the members and members adjudicating on the system and sending them through to us. At the moment, the system is not uh, working the way that we had designed it to be. It has encountered a lot of glitches, uh, but we have uh, the service provider uh, on, the, on site to rectify um, the system. Um, it is really a big challenge where all the chairpersons that we've had um, have uh, had very um, a lot of interest in and have focused on and proposed a lot of uh, solutions around it. We are believing we believe that we are nearing the end. Uh, we will either know whether the system is working or not working, um, and if we need to scrap it and get another system. Uh, but we are towards the end of that system. But it is really a huge problem at the moment. Uh, facilities um, challenge only relates to the fact that um, as part of the DTIC, we are having to be dependent and reliant on other 
um, entities for certain services like our IT services. Uh, we are reliant on uh, a few other um, actions on the DTIC and helping us on the infrastructure. And also with regard to hearing facilities, we have um, limitations there, but we're working on repartitioning to be able to overcome this. Um, um, and that's, that's about it, Chairperson, with regard to um, our challenges. And that brings an end our presentation to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, COO um, members. Uh, we have until 11 to do a Q&A section with the company's tribunal. So mm -hmm. can I have uh, hands for discussion? Members? Um, Chair, we may also ask the um, C company tribunal to stop sharing the document, Chair. Thanks. Okay. We have Mr. Thringshay, Mr. Mr. McPherson. Thring, McPherson. Biani. Mr. Right, I think let's start um, with Thring. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, just the first first question is with regards to the vacancies. Um, in terms of the organogram that was given to us, there are seven, va seven vacancies uh, currently exist. Um, we also note that there's there's been a decrease in, in cases, but currently for the 21-22 uh, financial year, cases have increased. So if cases have increased, uh, surely this also speaks to a need uh, to fill those vacancies. Uh, one could understand if there's been a decrease in cases in the previous years, um, that affects also income and so on. But now that the cases have actually increased, um, one would expect to see those vacancies actually being filled. So the first question is, when will those vacancies be filled? Uh, and then second question relates to the, the aspect of declining of, of cases. Um, what, what can one or what does the, um, the tribunal, company's tribunal attribute uh, the declining cases uh, to be? And then um, I'm not sure, Chair, whether I, I may have missed uh, the, any correction if there was, but on slide 21, um, slide 21 speaks to um, a 44 percent spend of budget by the end of the third quarter. And then it says, and for the remaining two quarters, that means that we have five out of four quarters, which is an impossibility. Uh, <clears throat> but if if uh, if that was corrected, I, I may have missed it. And that is on slide slide 21. Um, and then just a question. Um, the following slide on financial performance, uh, it, it gives expenditure in terms of expenditure for the two quarters. Uh, what was budgeted was 13,616,240 Rand. The actual expenditure is reflected as 11,870,300 uh, Rand. Uh, but then it gives a variance of uh, 234,754. My calculation that the variance should be around 1.7 million. Um, so is that another is that another error or is, is there something that I'm missing in terms of how that particular variance was actually captured? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable McPherson. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, I think unfortunately, you know, um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, as I said in the beginning, I think it would have been helpful to have had this discussion with the chair as well, um, because, you know, it, it's also, you know, good for him to be able to hear, you know, some of these views. So it's very difficult for me to articulate some of the things I want to, because I want to have an engagement uh, with him on, on some of the, you know, the frustrations or some of the, you know, sort of ways forward. Um, 
you know, with the tribunal. So I'm a bit, um, I'm a bit uh, stuck in, in how to proceed. I think you must just for for the purpose of this um, meeting. And, and I don't know if, um, because I, I I really would like to sort of have some questions. Uh, Chair, we appear to be losing uh, Honourable McPherson. Sorry, I, I I don't know if I had a bad connection, but I was just saying, you know, uh, I don't know if you've applied your mind on how we need to move forward um, in that engagement with the chair, because I really want to reserve my questions for uh, for, uh, for for Judge Davis. Honorable McPherson, we can't hear you. It seems like you have a very bad connection. I hope you can hear me. Honorable yeah. McPherson. Yeah, let me tap it out. Sure. I don't know what's going on. Okay. Sure, if I may. Yes. Yes. Ex Mr. McPherson was indicating whether you had made applied your mind to the question of Judge Davis, because you would like to reserve his questions for Judge Davis, if I'm correct, Mr. McPherson. Yes, no, I haven't applied my mind while I was listening to a presentation. I will come back to the committee on that. But I, I gave the indication that I'm considering having a, a special session with you, with the, with the chair. But um, Honorable McPherson has indicated that he will, that he will write, uh, write down his, on the, on, in the chat his questions. So let me move on then to Honorable Mbuyani. Chairperson, uh, thank you once again for the opportunity. Uh, I'm just having a few clarity seeking questions here. Uh, one is the question of prioritizing uh, and filling the, the vacancies. Uh, and also, if you relate the feeling of vacancies vis-a-vis -vis the market, uh, marketing of the tribunal, uh, I think those are priorities that uh, need to be taken care of by the, by the entity. Given the fact that uh, we are told that in applications uh, have been declined and uh, I wanted to check uh, the marketing strategy vis-a-vis -vis their education and awareness program, whether they do have footprint in all the provinces, more especially the deep rural uh, provinces. Because if you, we're talking of uh, application that has been declined. Maybe the masses does not have the information that there's a company tribunal uh, that can assist them. Uh, I just want to check how far are they uh, in terms of the footprint from all the provinces? Do they have offices maybe uh, in all the provinces or they are collaborating with other departments, uh, entities like your uh, company, your, C your CIPC, your NEF, uh, Competition Commission. Uh, does it have any impact in terms of addressing the challenges that we are having here? Because more especially in our rural areas, uh, people are, are crying foul about companies. They, the other one, Chair, is the procurement uh, to promote uh, transformation and empowerment of designated group. Can you get statistically to say in terms of this province, uh, we have allocated this to women, youth, uh, in terms of beneficiations, how are they doing it uh, as, the, as a stakeholder? Then the stakeholder management, as part of their, their mandate, uh, do they have 
meetings with the chieftaincy, councillors, community, so that they engage with those stakeholders for them to understand that if they have crisis in terms of companies, this is the entity that they, 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 they should at least engage with. Uh, maybe the last one here is the issue of uh, inadequate funding and resources. Because most of the resources here, they are going to human resources. In terms of uh, operational costs, I don't see any uh, figure around it. If they can just break down their figures, because almost 7 million rand out of the 11 million uh, goes to the salaries. Uh, in terms of operation, it's not clear. And also, we're told that uh, the, uh, the program of, of, of uh, outreach is the interviews and radios and so forth. But you are not told on the ground the full soldiers who are able to go door to door, maybe at the constituency level, so that they are able to brand and market uh, this entity. The uh, chair will stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Malamacha. Thank you, Chair. Let me also take this opportunity to welcome the presentation and start straight with this one from the finance. It is a well-known factor that the government, if not the state, has a lot of abandoned structures. But uh, you will be surprised in an institute where we're supposed to save money in a form of ensuring that this money goes for operation in a form of fulfilling the mandate. But yes, a bigger chunk of money is going for rental, renting offices. I, I will want to know what pushes that. Do, aren't we have, I mean, infrastructure that can be easily used right, to be depending on renting? Because Comrade Chair, the issue of renting, it has got a number of wrong things that you will never realize now. You only realize in the later stage that if it's not one of the senior member who own that particular rented uh, house, if not a structure building, it is a relative of that particular person. And these are the things that really, it raises a number of concern as compared to Mbiani, raised a number of concern where a chunk of money is going to salaries. So it's like we are getting money from the treasurer just to share amongst ourselves without considering that that money has to fulfill certain mandates. The issue of renting versus the usage of abandoned structure in that. Now, Chair, on the onogram, on, on I want us to coin it this way that it's not about to feel only. It is also about to say, come future, where are we? I want them to tell us, in terms of feeling this, do they consider the, 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 the recruiting of the unskilled to skill them so to come and replace those who are towards their exit? So they must be talking to us and say, we have recruited this. This is the age that we are considering. And we are definitely sure it will sustain the institute in effect that when this year is coming, we still have this personnel who are still here. On the withdrawal cases, what measures are in place that the matter is withdrawn for good faith and also it is not coming back in a form of saying, we withdrawn after I've been bribed, now I want to come back. What is it that's in place to ensure that a withdrawn matter really means it? And so that in the future, it does not necessarily come and be part of the burden that we find on the queue. Of course, it's good to say we have the outreach program, but if we are not inquiring about the, 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 the target stakeholders, who are their targeted stakeholders and the impact of that particular outreach, if we leave it without having the impact of the outreach, we will have a situation where we are 
in the very same meeting today, we are told that many people are not willing to utilize the entity which is there and free for that particular matter from the state to just assist them. In state, they are going where one, they are skimmed. There are some scam, a lot of scams. They are going where they are even paying money to be helped, whereas there is a, a, a what you call one, there is a free for one. So let me pause there carefully. Thank you very much, Honorable Mulder. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Now, to be short, um, I just wanted to confirm as well that I would reserve my comments and questions uh, till there's an appropriate um, uh, time for the judge to attend as well as he is the accountable officer. So um, I, I won't be asking any questions today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Mulder. I just, uh, before I hand to um, the CRO to manage uh, questions, I just wanted to check. I had uh, we my, previously my, my hand that... Oh, okay. I didn't uh, see your hand. Honorable no, I... Ernst Lamashe. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and, and I think I'm more convinced that uh, uh, Andre must have to add up some lenses into uh, his classes. Um, um, I, I did raise my hand on, on a lighter note. Uh, Chair, uh, um, on this matter, um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to uh, look at the stakeholder engagement. And the reason for looking at the stakeholder engagement is because this is a very important entity which seeks to address at the heart of it critical aspects that have a direct bearing on the livelihood of our people, at least to the extent that um, they have an opportunity to participate in the inclusive economy. This therefore, and, 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 and this, this therefore brings a very important question. The question around uh, access to information which is a constitutional imperative. It's a fundamental right. Hence, even the constitution has uh, provided that a legisl national legislation must be enacted to give effect to uh, the promotion of access. That's why we have the promotion of access to information act. Uh, I have no doubt in my mind, Chair, that the mandate of this entity, important as it is, if I were to contact, which I have done, by the way, um, in a couple of days ago, I have I have I have um, conducted, um, for instance, the president and the chairperson of NAFCOC in South Africa, and they have no clue of the existence of this entity. Yet, it talks to their constituents. So if you are, if, if the institution or if the entity would have uh, seminars and symposiums at universities, whose interest is it serving? Who are the stakeholders that they are meeting with? 
if they go to the university halls. If, 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 if I were to uh, go to Kishkamahuk, the Kobokob, in the Eastern Cape, or go to uh, Malelan, Kamshushwa, in Pumala, or go to a single win in KZN. And there are people there who have companies operating at a, 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 a SMME scale. Will they be aware of the existence of this institution, which is very, 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 very important to their day-to-day -day, um, um, understanding of the business relations, the ethics of managing businesses, uh, the, 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 the challenges that we have of fronting where our people are taken for a ride used by previously advantaged, exploiting the opportunities created by uh, the interventions created uh, for inclusive economy. Now, will, 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 will we find those people with a full appreciation of the importance of the mandate of this entity? So how would uh, they give us some clarity in terms of the stakeholder management um, 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 and processes that uh, they have undertaken. Have they met, for instance, with NAFCOC? NAFCOC? Have they met with uh, institutions like SAGA, uh, the National House of Traditional Leaders in respect of rural communities and, and all of that? Because what we want is not only about the good presentations before the portfolio committee. But those presentations must find expression in terms of proper assimilation of that information by those who are affected. So that's what I just want to check. And if perhaps they have not done so as yet, are they considering uh, to stretch their tentacles such that that information finds expression to those who really need it. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, just finally, I just wanted to ask uh, the COO to speak on the, um, what, it, what it is that they have planned uh, to improve the uptake on the electronic management system. And then also, um, how far are you with your discussions about self-funding, um, your discussions with the DTIC? I want there are there is 40 minutes left for, for your responses. So um, let's see if we can finish with uh, the company's tribunal at 11. Uh, thank you, COO. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, I thank you and the members uh, for the, the best of abilities to um, respond to them. And to the extent that we do not have uh, information, uh, a written response. Uh, but let me begin. Uh, Honorable Wayne asked a question around the organogram and said uh, we might now the organogram. Um, so in the presentation, we did mention that 
evaluation in, uh, and when we finally get to the end of it, we have no idea not be there or might change consistency at the moment. We've actually put on hold the feeling of consistency. for them we will then be um the men the members concerned. um with regard to um the decline um there was the reasons for the decline as known to us would be um in situation we are undertaking a study to actually determine the exact reasons for this decline and to also um, get recommendations uh, on how we cause uh, going uh, with our gut feeling regarding what we think might be the reasons for the marketing and that's why we found a full on in terms of marketing um, there have been other reasons that uh, have been um, um, given to us uh, being the reasons for the decline with the quality of the decisions that uh, we have been issuing in the past Matters have already been This is really sort of ad hoc um, and uh, sporadic. I said uh, we are for, for the first Expired, uh, and this would include cases such as permissions for about them for the next three years while those permits are still um, in place. Um, so that is the nature of the work. And um, there was a question around the CFO. To, um, to deal with, and another one on the variants, um, she'll handle um, those two, and so the others on finance. Uh, Honorable McPherson did ask the we have noted that. Jenny asked about the prioritizing and filling of vacancies, but I've already responded to that question. Um, and there is a question that is coming back again and marketing in the rural areas. Um, Honorable Viana asked um, um, uh, also asked. So let me answer um, the question. This means that our cost of a pretty much predetermined legislation tells us is that we are to deal with company related disparate disparate It means that the people that can come to the tribunal would be the registered in terms of 
what we would like to do more. We would like to help um, societies that have helped non profit organizations and all of such uh, other is is very limited. So in the past, we have actually had more community outreach, but some of the criticisms that we then received and part of the backlash that we got from those uh, that take to, um, should I say to the exclusion to some extent to um, stakeholders that are limited of them was that uh, we are really not talking to the stakeholders um, uh, for this one. And the backlash was really a reduction in our view in the number of people out and engaged communities this would probably not be um, engaged in the uh, kind of activities they have disputes uh, and some of them would really not have a uh, company so this why in our report we do show uh, how many outreaches we have in uh, engagements that we are activities. So the stakeholder engagements that we do have uh, cut out from our relationship that I mentioned and because of the criticism that we received in the past, we have not them out. We have only just reused them from provinces to provinces in terms of stakeholder engagement. We do go to schools even uh, on youth day or whatever, uh, on ministerial uh, uh, outreach uh, programs as well, but we do have our own where we meet with uh, municipalities the rural areas, but these are not many. They are very limited for the very reason that I've already outlined that one, they are not directly have financial constraints. Perhaps the uh, question that was asked uh, by Honorable Prince Gamache on uh, engagement will be able to confirm uh, but, uh, with enough talk and um, so I'm not quite sure perhaps uh, but in the past engagements uh, with municipalities and I'm uh, I'm believing that South would 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 also just fall there have to check our records with regards to the because of the limitation in the mandate that I, I, I have mentioned. We are not oblivious to the fact that right that register companies tomorrow um, and that information also in terms of to us. And that is for that reason that we do still engage in this. Uh, but had we more money, we would be doing more of them. There was um, a, a question on uh, whether we, in terms of footprints and presence, we are actually having offices we don't. Um, and 
again, that's really uh, because of limitations of financing totals, um, which does not go far enough. We do realize they could the engagement that we so, uh, We do believe that the question um, they they constitute important one for our students that will tomorrow be um, lawyers uh, and will be direct and all of those people who are to our mandate. Um, so that's perhaps my answer with regard to the of Uh, constituencies that have been mentioned uh, are a little bit far removed out to them. And um, there was a question on so this aggregation uh, on groups and and, and, and procurement spam to you. Um, um, there was a specific question really with regard to the outreaches again on who are the food door to door and that kind marketing known in certain communities, uh, which is a very good argument to make. Um, and had we money, we would definitely uh, be having this food soldiers spreading the message far and wide. So with regard to the first one, uh, we are in total agreement with the member. We would love to do it uh, even if we could Areas that we are not able to reach them or something like that. And with more funding, we can do um, these things. did ask um, questions around um, the rent that um, the government. Um, um, he seemed to be wondering why it is that we are renting a space so now it's even having interest in this kind of uh, the member that uh, not a interest in none whatsoever because Precede a lot of us. So, since they and likely uh, this play, uh, and transaction really. Uh, we reflected on our books, uh, but we also. Received as a the donation uh, from on our books just to show um, we expected to be paid this money uh, when we become financially viable. But at the moment, it really in real terms, it is only just reflected. Uh, Honorable Malimacha, uh, it is just not possible for us to be having any kind of interest holder. And the ones the transaction further on. Uh, but I can assure you, even if we are renting from the private organization, 
the salaries again? Are we recruiting and positions that can be so we only have skilled uh, professionals at the moment? Again, in our mandate, these are the kind of people that we can have. Yeah, we can mention that we what is now 2023. We started in 2022. That's the presentation. Period during a period which falls outside the reporting period. Um, and that is the finance. Um, so I think perhaps um, uh, this is where we make um, contribution um, to skill those South Africa withdrawal to say with regard to the cases that have been thrown, what are very valid question that does not allow us it with attendance uh, at some point by or closing some of the matters that have been um, lying fallow is that the locations that have been submitted and not been or that have been used. Um, they can the applications again and if we challenge what allows you um, to say what happened. To resurrect the application, it comes for the amendment of the egg. And there was a question about being mindful of the fact that we do what we are mandated. Are really the companies registered in terms of the Companies Act, officials, directors, uh, shareholders, um, and the attorneys and legal professionals that help them with regard to and to some extent the account in some form or another uh, in the affairs. Of, of, of the companies living outside of course, the the community part of the stakeholders, but in terms of the Reserving, and I think I've already answered my So, chairperson, to your questions that you asked the chair, uh, what are uh, um, now we have to deal with? And make it uh, work uh, um, 
discussion with the auditors uh, that is part of the implementation that we have, we should be looking at getting a legal record. What is it that we can do um, legally? Um, but that's what we are doing. But we are also thinking if the system has to be scrapped. in the system. I do need to mention that uh, the repair problems by the technical challenges in a service provider to be a little bit out Having there were no um, email system that we are having to send time and that so the systems are challenges outside from. Very harsh letters uh, with the chairpersons that we've had in terms of what they must leave uh, and by what uh, and other challenges have has delayed the. Uh, the To funding by the CIPs direct to, to, to do that on their own, they would need an amendment on the legislation to be able to do that or some instruction at a hand. So, those discussions for that, that they will not be able to help us uh, just through negotiations and discussions. And decision cities. We need it to have to end or oh, at the ministerial level if it can really We um apart from the funding issues, I think there was a general really question whether. certain Instructing them um, amend uh, the registration of the response to implement the decision of the kind of collaboration that we have from time to time with the case management system. We've also gone to the 
from team from them. Fortunately, we found that our systems are very different. Uh, our system is what does that mean? It means that CIP does not need CIPC does not need documentation uh, to get the verification or PC and there's a need for an ID to be verified. They don't have a complete just with the department of home um, that the, the ID is correct. So our systems using systems that are similar to um, land systems with that from the finance uh, to take a few questions on the Thank you very much, uh, CFO. If we can just appeal for you to be straight to the point we are running out of time i don't want to put you under pressure thank you very much over to you okay thanks president um i'll start with the issue of salaries um, company. um we as a share of employee heavy uh, budget because it our um, um, expenditures. If you look at our very low, we uh, hence you will always but the, the the budget for conversation of people will always is that we keep creating is that we operate to optimize. So. Um, of employee because we are a tribunal members. Um, um, you will also see that when you service administration, that is another element that shows the addition of employee will always be um, high. Uh, <clears throat> then the, the situation that and um, those um, with disability. Um, I don't have the target. We, we have very small budget on goods and services. Um, Second quarter, uh, uh, based in housing, um, and but as a, as I've already uh, um, for the designated group, uh, which the information will be um, disseminated uh, with the information. The financial information I, I presented is based do not the error. Uh, which will be corrected. Then um, the question on um, the inadequate the issue of compensation of employee being heavy, uh, budget heavy. Um, I will wait if there's I will have to go through the slides. 
Thank you very much, CFO. I see there's a hand from Honorable Mbiani. Honorable Mbiani. Thank you, Chair. Once more. I think my question was not uh, properly answered. Uh, the collaboration with the TIC uh, and other entities. Because as we speak, the CIPC is in all over all the provinces. They are there, they are footprinted there. <clears throat> so what is the reason of the tribunal, uh, uh, maybe the company tribunal not to have one or two personnel in each and every CIPC offices around the country so that they, they cannot run serious challenges of companies while they are staying seated in one place in Pretoria. And another issue, Chair, that I think was not properly is the issue of procurement in terms of transformation and empowerment. We indicated that at least if, if they can be able to break through in terms of demographics and, 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 and also groups and staff to say, this one has been part of the beneficiation and this one is part of the beneficiation. <clears throat> the last one chair is the applicant application uh, that we received. It seems to be declining. I want uh, to get a reason why is this declining is because uh, people are not aware of the city or it's because only uh, uh, targeted stakeholders that they are talking to. Because the reason for me that we're given that they're attending uh, universities and, and so forth, some of those universities, they're still student. They still have to uh, choose their curriculum, but we're talking of people that are on the ground. They are always be dealt with by these African uh, 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 people that they are coming and operating their spices. And also the question of uh, uh, giving a situation where they will just pick a name and put the name of this one into a company and uh, the relationship between them and the competition commission. I'm audible, Chair. Yes, uh, are you, have you concluded? No, I wanted to conclude, but I heard someone uh, was talking to me as well. Oh, apologies, yeah. continue. Yes, so, so that you are able to see what has been uh, done in each and every province, because now if the program is specific to university students, but there are people who are suffering on the ground in terms of uh, fronting, people are being fronted. They can take just a ID number uh, for a receptionist and put it in, in their CK so that they are able to gain the point of transformational agenda the triple B E kind of arrangement. So I wanted the uh, more specific to be uh, dealt with with the uh, around the competition commission and also the footprint at the at the, at the provincial level. Uh, thank you for that. But I'm not forcing them to uh, respond now. If there's no response now, but they can go and read uh, and write all the responses so that we're able to get exactly what is the amended because. Some of us we know of them because we are parliamentarians. That there's a committee, a competi I mean, company tribunal where you can raise your issues. People they have challenges, but they don't know where to raise their issues. And for free of charge, now they are opting to for lawyers and so forth because they are not informed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Mbuyani. I will request. The follow-up questions that are coming now that it be replied to in writing to the committee within seven days because we have another entity to engage with. So I think it's going to make us very short on time, but I will take Honorable Thring and Honorable Burns Ungamashe. Honorable Thring? Um, yeah, no, thank you, Chair. 
Chair, I, I think I accept that, uh, just for the, the CFO, I accept that uh, there would be a correction um, on, on slide 21, which is, you know, perhaps it's a typo, third quarter should should read second quarter. So, so that's fine. But Chair, I think the, the CFOs, for me, what seems to be a very simple mathematical um, equation or deduction, uh, you know, your actual expenditures is over, or oh, sorry, the, the expenditure budgeted was 13 million. The actual spent was just over 11 million. The variance normally is the difference between the two. <clears throat> and the difference in my calculations is about 1.7 million. Now, the CFO said that she doesn't have the slides. She'll have to check the slides, but surely she's got the slide in front of her. And I don't want to uh, want it to appear as if I'm, you know, it's been, I'm being dismissed. And, and if the CFO could have just said, yes, um, there is again, perhaps a typo in terms of the numbers, uh, but to say, I'll come back to you in, you know, in what clearly is a, is a simple deduction um, or perhaps an alternate accounting program that has been used that I don't know of. Um, but I'm, I'm not happy with, with the response. I, you know, I, I'll have to look at the slides um, with regards to those, with those, uh, those amounts. So I'm, I'm not happy with the response. Thank you. Noted, uh, com uh, Honorable uh, Thring, Honorable Burns Lamashi. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, well, Chair, mine is just to uh, suggest that uh, the company tribunal must develop, even if it's one page or two page uh, document in terms of clearly articulating their mandate, uh, conduct details, and, and all of it. And all that information be distributed to the PCOs, uh, among other uh, institutions that will be helpful in terms of disseminating information. Um, and, and because it's, it's, this is very difficult. I also want to uh, emphasize uh, the I, uh, I, I I did hear that uh, yes they are dealing with oh, Honorable Mbuyane said they are dealing with uh, the company directors shareholders and so on. It's exactly for that reason because uh, members of NAFCO, for instance, these are people who own companies. I I, I will make. I have. A, a, a person who runs an architectural company for the 20 years. When I spoke about uh, Ms. Ken, uh, uh, Kenley here uh, in Cape Town, when I spoke about company tribunal, he did not know anything about it, having in business for more than 20 years. And you remember, this is an architect, a person who is professional, who, 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 I mean, it, it, by all standards, quite literate to understand issues. Now, if Sean cannot understand it being in Cape Town, how much more uh, to a person uh, in Gobokob? So, so when, when, when we spoke about asked information, it's exactly for that reason. The, 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 the department, also has a role to ensure that the information that is there in the hands of the public entities reporting to the department, that information must be accessed by people of South Africa. Is their right? So, so, so I really want to uh, appeal to company tribunal and any other um, 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 entity. Just to, to, to just, I won't take a bit of your time, Chair. You know, there's an entity called RAF. I asked one person who is now the ambassador of, because the longest time people were exploited by lawyers. His application was processed without any participation of the lawyer. No commissions were paid to the lawyer. He received all the money that was due to him. 
So it's exactly for that kind of reason that we want to put emphasis because uh, with knowledge, uh, people make better decisions. Without knowledge, they are exposed uh, to, 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 to uh, tendencies of those uh, who will prey uh, on, 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 the, uh, on their innocence as well as ignorance. So I really want to appeal. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Honourable Member. Thank you for your uh, practical advice around PCO officers and other institutions. I'm sure the um, tribunal uh, will take that up. And I want to thank the COO and the CFO, and in his absence, uh, the chairperson whom we will uh, engage with at a later stage, and ask that you, these follow-up questions, please be attended to um, in writing to the uh, Portfolio Committee Secretariat. Uh, we are running a bit behind time. We will now have a five minute, um, five minute body break, and then we'll come back just before half past 11, and then we will uh, continue with our meeting. So just a five minute body break, and then we'll proceed again. Thank you. Chairperson, thank you very much. We've taken note. Thank you.
our agenda item. Recording and, in progress. And we will receive a report uh, on the Export Credit Insurance Corporation. And I hand over to the chairperson, Mr. Darmalingham. Uh, Good, uh, good, uh, good morning, still, uh, Chairperson and uh, Honourable Ministers and all present. Uh, I think it's one it's been a long time since we as East Okahai, as ECIC, have had the opportunity to come to the Portfolio Committee, so privilege for that. But in today we have our uh, formally, uh, I've got a note, uh, he's been appointed as CEO, that's Mr. Mandisi in Kushlu. But in terms of the regulatory framework within the country, we still wait the prudential authority's final approval. And that's why from a matter of uh, good governance, we will refer to the CEO as still acting. But from a minister's point of view and from a board's point of view, uh, Mandisi has in fact been approved as the CEO. who seems to and the team and the way he will take it forward. And here I will be on the call throughout and uh, I will assist Mandisi wherever and then take it. Thank you very much. Acting CEO. Good, mo good morning. I think in terms of our delegation, we have the chairperson was just in the office of this manager in the office of this of slides that we've prepared for the committee. Right. Thank you, Chairperson. I think the, the brief we got was that we would have to cover financial and non-financial performance for quarter one and quarter two of this financial year, which is the 2022-23 financial year. Okay, in terms of the broad topics that we'll be covering, we'll touch on the mandate of ECIC. We'll then go straight to the financial results, which will be handled by the CFO. And then we'll come back to both non-financial performance indicators for these two quarters. And then in the last slide, we talk broadly about what work we're doing to assist exporters to take advantage of the African continental free trade agreement. Just to recap the mandate of ECIC, ECIC was established in 2001 and derives its mandate from the ECIC founding legislation. The mandate of ECIC is to facilitate cross-border investments and export trade between South Africa and the rest of the world. Whilst we may support projects to any part of the world where we have a strategic focus on the African continent and other emerging markets. And we also have a priority focus on intra-Africa trade and the various sectors where the DTIC has concluded master plans. But this is not on an exclusive basis, it's on a non-exclusive basis. We can support other sectors which are not covered by the master plans. Historically, ECIC mandate was to support capital goods, exports, and services. That's why you tend to see that the transactions we support tend to be big ticket items, huge sums of project amounts, and fewer transactions 
rather than high volume of transactions. However, more recently in 2021, our mandate was expanded to cover consumer goods and short-term transactions. So this is a relatively new mandate that we've been given now, which we're working on. In the next slides, then we deal with the financial results. I'll hand over to the CFO. Thank you, CEO, and um, good morning to the members. Um, uh, Chad, before I start with the presentation of the results, I would just like the uh, committee members to note the following, that um, in terms of the numbers that I will be presenting now, those have been prepared as using rent as a presentation currency but then those have been prepared using US dollar as our functional currency. This is mainly because um, we operate in the export uh, market and as a result, the, the transactions, they tend to be denominated in dollars. So as a result, our uh, portfolio is, um, around 90% of that portfolio is uh, denominated in dollars. And I will, um, however, because um, we are a South African entity, we are still expected to present our tax numbers using rent as a functional currency. So the reason I'm providing this background is because um, of the impact that the exchange rates have on our uh, foreign exchange uh, gains and losses. So in terms of um, the numbers, uh, wow. when we prepare our financial statements, we would be converting um, rent transactions to US dollar to calculate the exchange rate differences. But then um, when we calculate our tax liability, they are converting our US dollar transactions to the rents. So as a result, it creates a mismatch when one is looking at the profit before at the uh, profit before tax versus the profit after tax. But I will touch on that uh, in detail uh, through the later slides. And as the CEO has mentioned, uh, due to the type of um, transactions that we insure, those tend to be lumpy and, um, they, and there's, uh, uh, there's few transactions. So as a result, when I uh, take the committee through the numbers, you will then be able to see the, the, the impact those uh, transactions are having because the, trans, uh, the, the numbers tend to be material. And then in terms of our financials, um, which is the statement in, finance, in, in um, financial performance, which was formerly known as the income statement, we usually present the numbers, we split those in two, where we present the information from our insurance business, which is a, a denoted as the underwriting results. And we split that information uh, separately from the rest of the transactions. So I will be starting with the results from our underwriting business. So these results are made up of end premiums, the incurred claims, which is net of any salvages, and um, we also factor uh, our operating expenses. So in terms of the budget, um, you would note that uh, we were estimating that the end premiums and the operating expenses would have been more than the, apologies, the incurred claims and the operating expenses would have been more than our end premiums, thus resulting in an underwriting loss of 67 million. This was mainly due to an IBNR 
uh, provision that was raised for potential new claims. If I may just elaborate on that, the IBNR is a provision that we create for uh, projects that are in distress. So, and it's calculated as a percentage of our exposure. So at so when we were budgeting, um, we had assumed that there will be, uh, or we had raised a provision for potential new claims to the value of 121 million. So those had not materialized. Hence, um, you are we are reflecting that our actual underwriting results are more than what we had budgeted for, where we are sitting with the underwriting results for quarter one to the value of 50 million rents. And um, this positive um, variance in the IBNR was also coupled with additional uh, uh, premiums that we earned, which amounted to 54 million uh, rents. And also there were some uh, timing differences, savings on the operating expenses to the value of 6 million rents. However, if you note, um, these uh, positive variances when one is comparing our budgeted results versus what we actually achieved, those positive variances were netted off by additional claims that were paid, uh, which amounted to 66 million rents. And um, these claims were mainly as a result of um, additional interest that was paid for one of our uh, project, which is uh, the Lego Boom uh, project. So basically this project um, is a mining, uh, it's in the mining sector and it was experiencing challenges um, with its low, a quality of diamonds and a low quantity of um, reserves. So all of this was happening prior COVID. So now when COVID uh, kicked in, then it exacerbated the challenges where as a, uh, due to um, the low um, market prices, which were unsustainable for the project. Hence, it ended up uh, experiencing financial difficulties. Then I would, okay, the next. Okay, in terms of um, this slide chair, um, we are now indicating how uh, the underwriting results are now translating to profit or loss after tax. So uh, you would have noted, Chair, that in the previous uh, uh, slide, we were indicating that in terms of the budget, we were estimating to generate an underwriting loss of 67 million, but then uh, after considering all these trans, all the other transactions like your in your investment uh, income and um, forex, that uh, uh, we were now expecting that the uh, the amount after tax will now be a profit to the value of 152 million rands. And in terms of the actual share, it was the opposite, where in terms of the underwriting results, we had made a gain of 50 million. But then when one is looking at the an amount, an amount after tax, it now becomes a loss of um, 510 million as at uh, end of quarter one. So these um, differences, Chair, it's mainly because firstly on the investments, Chair, um, where in the original budget, uh, we were assuming that we will generate positive returns 
but now we ended up generating losses mainly because of um, the increases in interest rates and um, the tension between uh, Russia and um, and Ukraine, which resulted in negative returns globally for the investments. So as a result, there was a negative variance between the budget and the actual to the value of 180 million rands. And then another uh, item that resulted in the, in the um, loss was mainly due to an IMU grant which was expected in the first quarter, but then was uh, deferred and that was received in the second quarter around uh, September. So that resulted in a uh, negative variance of 214 million. And lastly, Chair, the other contributor was the foreign exchange losses where the rent uh, depreciated against the US dollar by 5.39%, while we had assumed that it will only depreciate by 1.29%. And Chair, you will note that uh, there is also a negative variance on our tax, which amounts to 90, 94 million rents. And that is mainly because of the mismatch that I talked about earlier, Chair. So in terms of um, the tax, as I've mentioned, it's calculated on the rent numbers where we convert our US dollars to rents while the, the, the financials are, or the loss that we are reflecting there, which is the 285 when comparing to actual, that is uh, where we were converting rents to US dollars. So it meant, Chair, in terms of the rent financials, we were recording a gain of 482. So it meant that the tax liability is calculated on the numbers which incorporates a foreign exchange gain. However, as um, we are uh, considered to be a US dollar entity when we, are, we prepare our financial statements, on those numbers we are reflecting a loss of 317 million. So effectively, Chair, um, the, the, on the tax calculation, there is an additional gain of 18 of, of um, 800 million uh, uh, worth of foreign exchange gains that's uh, resulting in excessive taxes to the value of 216 million rents. So in terms of the mismatch chair, um, we had um, engaged um, with the um, receiver of revenue just to see um, if we will be able able to um, get a tax ruling to minimize the tax impact. And unfortunately, Chair, based on the current uh, legislation where uh, the tax is, when one is calculating the tax, we have to convert other currencies to rents. We were not uh, able to get that ruling, but we are considering other options or avenues Chair, to minimize the mismatch going forward. And Chair, in terms of our um, financial performance at the end of quarter one, um, in terms of our total assets, those have reduced by 336 million rands and this is mainly due to the claim that was paid for the Lego Bomb project that I talked about earlier. And that claim amounted to 875 million rands. And the reason why Chair, this, um, the assets are reducing by a fraction of that, it's because Chair, um, those are netted off by additional premiums that we get from under writing new business chair. And then um, that claim uh, that we had paid, it also reduced 
our liabilities, where our insurance contract liabilities have reduced. So this is because in the 2022 financial year, which is the March uh, 2022 numbers, we had raised a IPNR provision, uh, which is the claims uh, outstanding provision. And that provision was only paid in the first quarter of 2023. Hence, it's resulting in that uh, reduction in terms of our insurance contract liabilities. And and um, lastly, Chair, when one is looking at our liab uh, liabilities as well, you will note that in terms of our, I, our IMU liability, uh, that has, has increased slightly, and that increase was mainly due to the depreciation of the rent when comparing the rates as at March versus uh, June 2022. So all these transactions, Chair, have resulted in our equity for the first quarter increasing by 271 million uh, rents, which is uh, from 6.6 .6 billion to 6.9 billion. And this is mainly due to exchange rates. So these are currency trans, uh, translation uh, gains. And Chair, in terms of our of this slide, uh, we are showing the underwriting results for quarter two, and we are also including the forecast to quarter four, which is March 2023. So in terms of the budget, Chair, um, we had uh, assumed that year to date quarter two there will be a, neg a, a, a loss of 133 million. And as I've mentioned earlier, that is mainly due to the future uh, uh, provisions, to the provisions that were created for future claims, which did not uh, materialize. And um, hence, Chair, you are seeing that positive variance of 162 million in terms of the change in OCR when comparing to the actuals in quarter two. And the other positive variance uh, similar to quarter one was also the additional premiums that we earned, which amounted to 178 million as at end of quarter two. And uh, this resulted in our, so these positive variants resulted in us achieving underwriting results of 150 as at um, September, 2022. So Chair, when projecting to the end of the financial year, we are expecting that uh, this underwriting results will reduce slightly, where it will reduce from 150 million and it reduces to 127 million as at March 2023. And this is mainly due to um, the additional claims that we foresee we will be paying by March 2023, which amounts to 265. So Chair, in terms of um, these uh, claims, um, those have been um, received and they, we are uh, busy uh, evaluating those. And the, uh, the cause for these uh, claims were due to the financial uh, difficulties that the government of Ghana is experiencing. However, Chair, um, this uh, claim that we are expecting to pay will be netted off by the additional premiums that we will be earning for the second half of the year, which amounts to 279 million. And we will also be recognizing salvage income to the value of 79 for the remainder of the period, Chair. And then lastly, Chair, in terms of the income statement, uh, similar to first quarter, 
where um, the, in terms of the budget, the, we had an underwriting loss, but then it converts to a profit after tax at the end of the quarter. And, um, and similarly for the actuals, we had an underwriting um, profit uh, in quarter two, but then when one is looking at the, an amount after tax, it translates to a loss after tax. And that loss is similar to the um, quarter one results. It's mainly due to negative investment returns and the foreign exchange losses that we suffered in quarter two. And those losses, Chair, you will note that uh, when one is comparing to the budget, there is a negative variance of 547 million worth of Forex losses. And this is mainly because uh, we had assumed that the rent will depreciate by 1.29%, but it, uh, however, depreciated by 23.66%. And then, Chair, um, when that's uh, resulting in this uh, again, when one is looking at our at our rent financials and then the gain that was created in terms of the rent financials it was 349 million but then in terms of the us dollar numbers we had recorded a loss of 579 million so it meant that uh, when we were calculating the tax number there was an additional 1.5 billion worth of forex gains which were taken into account when we calculating this number that's resulting in excessive uh, taxes being charged and um, lastly, Chair, in terms of um, when one is looking uh, at the focus too much, we are expecting that the loss will reduce from five from 698 million and it will reduce to 505 million. So the reduction is mainly due to additional uh, investments that we will be generating where the majority of the losses that were suffered in the first half of the year will be reversed. And we have started uh, re reflecting those uh, uh, um, profits in the third quarter already. And Chair, in terms of our, of our statement of a financial position, on the assets, Chair, when um, we compare our March figures, the September figures, and the March 2023 figures, uh, you will note that the majority of our uh, assets comes from the in, uh, investments and cash. And then in terms of those numbers, we are expecting that by March 2023, there will be a, a, a slight reduction to the September numbers. However, when one is comparing September 2022 numbers versus June 2022, uh, for, between the two quarters, there has been a uh, an increase, and that increase was mainly due to the depreciation of the exchange rate, where our US dollar assets were converted at a higher exchange rate, hence um, we are seeing that significant increase. But then when we compare to, or when we project too much, we are expecting a, a slight reduction as the exchange rate is expected to um, appreciate. And then in terms of our liabilities, on the liabilities, it's um, slightly different where uh, when one is looking at the, the, the differences between 
June and September is consistent with the movements on our total assets where the liabilities have increased because of the exchange rates. However, when we compare to March 2023, then we are still seeing an increase on the liabilities and this is mainly due to the um, unearned premiums that we recognize for those uh, projects that we underwrite. Thank you. And um, in and uh, Chair, if you recall, um, uh, we had around um, October 2020, 2016, we had uh, we took over the IMU obligation, and at the date when we took over that obligation, we took a over a, a, an amount or a liability to the value of 2 billion. And I'm happy to note, Chair, that uh, that liability has since reduced from 2 billion to 657 million as at uh, the end of September. And that is because, Chair, we had paid uh, IMU claims to the value of 100 and 1.7 billion as uh, at September. And Chair, um, uh, uh, and in terms of this IMU uh, obligation, we do or we still continue to receive um, claims. And as at uh, September year to date, we had received grants, uh, IMU grant to the value of 1.7 billion. And that uh, amount was taxed, uh, which resulted to us paying additional tax to the value of 162 million rents year to date. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and all the committee members. Uh, this slide just summarizes, given that ECIC conducts uh, insurance business, uh, capital management is a very important principle for the organization. And in essence, essence capital management simply means ensuring that the, the organization's available capital exceeds the capital that it needs to hold, given the risks that the organization is taking. Um, so the first little graph is just showing you that uh, currently ECIC roughly sits on about 8 billion rands of capital uh, that we can utilize to underwrite uh, insurance business. And we, uh, our risk appetite has said that we can position almost 7 billion of that to take risk with. We also then split that uh, allocation between uh, the underwriting, which is the main business of uh, the mandate of ECIC. But given that we do have assets and those assets are invested, uh, that investments do attract some market risk. So we did need to hold some capital to cover those risks as well. But we, we allocate only 20% uh, towards investment risk. It's also important to note that we measure our required capital given the risks that we are exposed to on, on two separate measures. The first measure is what the regulatory authority, the presidential authority requires us to hold. That is a formal, formulaic calculation that is applied across all insurance companies. Uh, but given the unique nature of ECIC's business, we do an, what we call an economic, economic capital calculation. Uh, and that calculation reflects the unique risks that ECIC is exposed to. Uh, and uh, that then gives us a measure to determine how much capital we need, need to hold uh, for the risk that we are exposed to. Uh, and it's also important to not just look at uh, our solvency position, meaning available capital relative to required capital at a single point in time. It's important for us to project this throughout the strategic plan. Uh, and because as part of that strategic plan, we obviously have new transactions that we envisage that we will be supporting. And we want to make sure that we have sufficient capital available to support those transactions. Um, and you'll note that that's shown in the line graph that shows the projection uh, all the way to 2027. And you'll note the color schemes uh, between the green, red, and amber. That just reflects uh, the organization's risk appetite, where we say 
that we want to make, we always want to ensure that our available capital covers our required capital by at least 1.3 times cover or 130%. And you'll note that uh, we, we, we remain above that threshold throughout the projection period or the strategic planning period. Another important metric that we look at is uh, the little graph there in dollars. So if you would translate our available capital to US dollars, given that that's the main currency in which we conduct our business, that converts, that uh, roughly 8 billion rands converts to about $450 million. And then we reflect that uh, relative to the exposures that we're underwriting. And you can see there, we, we highlight the large transactions that we, we have underwritten and, and just showing that our available capital exceeds uh, those transactions. And it's important to note that uh, we don't just look at the exposure of each transaction itself, but if the, that transaction were to claim, we also expect to recover some salvages from, uh, from that transaction. Uh, so that's a better metric to then look at. That would be the orange bar that takes into account potential salvages. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I think we continue now to focus both on the specific corporate targets that are, are contained in our strategic plan. I think the first of those targets is the value of approved transactions. These are transactions under the old mandate. So the annual target here is 550 million US dollars. I think the point here to re-emphasize here, these are annual targets because of the nature of our business. We don't have so much volume that we can track it per quarter. So I think as at quarter one, only one transaction had been approved to the equivalent value of 8.6 million US dollars. And this was the let's say diamonds transaction in Lesotho. We also have a target that tracks the number of deals approved, again, under the old mandate. Again, here the target is four. As at quarter one, we had approved only one transaction. Then we have a separate target. I think the reason for, for the variance um, is that, like we say, because these are capital projects, they have a, a slow gestation period. So you're able maybe to pick up uh, traction on these projects towards the second half of the financial year. It may depend. In some years, you may have a good start. In other years, you may have a slow start. It so happens that in this particular financial year, we've had a slow start. And later on in the slides, we do show what is the outlook at the moment. Uh, under the new mandate, we have value of approved transactions as a target of 60 million. <laughs> By quarter one and quarter two, no transactions had been approved as yet. Again, in this area, it's a new mandate. We've set up a new business unit and a deal originating team that is looking to originate new transactions in this area. There's also advocacy work to go and reach out to, to the market to alert them about the changes in our mandate. The other deliverable is the export passport program. And the intention here this is a cooperation agreement to be concluded between the DTIC, ECIC, IDC, and NEF. Um, the idea being that we're looking to reach out to emerging and potential emerging exporters to bring them into the export value chain by providing them with customized support packages. And the intention is that uh, at least five companies should benefit under this support program. At the moment, by quarter two, a concept note had been shared with the DTIC and, and other parties. And uh, by quarter two, the draft cooperation agreement had been developed. Um, there have been engagements with the different parties to bring them on board. I think ECIC and the DTIC are spearheading this particular initiative, but we bring on board the IDC and the NEF is part of the DTIC family entities so that we can collaborate. I think part of the approach here is that uh, we all bring different value adds into this arrangement. For example, the IDC would provide lending facilities. It was traditional, that's what they do, they're a lender. 
The NEF as well will also provide lending facilities, but with a specific focus on black owned companies. Well, that's the specific mandate of the NEF. ECIC will then bring the insurance part of the package so that we can pull all these resources under one roof that a client can get a, sort of a one-stop shop facility, all the funding plus the insurance support. And then the DTIC brings to us uh, the currently they do have a program which goes to different provinces where they provide education to potential companies who may want to become exporters. So now what we want to say, after the, these entities have received training, they should be aware of the products that are available that could enable them to actually participate in the export transactions. So all of those packages then from training to funding to insurance, uh, is to give them then the full, you know, full package or suit of support that will enable them to graduate from potential exporters to actual exporters, and then some from small exporters to bigger exporters. So this support is not exclusive. It does not exclude medium-sized exporters and established exporters, but there's a strong particular bias to emerging exporters and even black owned companies through the link with the NEF. So it's part of our objectives to transform the sector, to expand the overall post export basket out of South Africa and to bring elements of transformation. It was traditionally because most of our projects have been high capital value projects. The main beneficiaries or participants tend to be well-established companies. Smaller companies do participate as subcontractors, but now we're going one step further where we're reaching out even to emerging or potential exporters and we want to bring them into the fold. One of the targets is the B level. Currently we are still at level one, but this one will only be verified after year end. That's how the, the, the method works. So at this stage, we can't anticipate anything other than that we will indeed be reaching level one. Obviously, this reflects the procurement processes of the company, the staff complement of the company, the board composition of the company, the ESD program that we, we roll out to various beneficiaries. Some of, for instance, of our beneficiaries were part of the Black Exporters and Industrialists Conference that was hosted uh, last year by, by the president and the minister. So we do have such programs, which obviously when translated and evaluated, translate to us then achieving a level 1B scorecard. Then we have um, some of themes or objectives which are linked to us building a capable state, meaning us be becoming a capable entity. These have a staff or internal focus. For instance, staff retained. We have a target of 85% um, staff retention. We do give allowance that there could be movements up to 15%, but to date in quarter one, we achieved 98%. In quarter two, we achieved 97%. I'll ask our head of HR just to comment as to why we're able to, this, to have this high level of staff retentions, Mapula. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the high staff retention is attributed to the good corporate culture that the corporation has, but also that um, the value proposition that the corporation gives its employees meet um, their requirements. We gather this information as we conduct employee engagement surveys, and in that regard, it helps us to achieve that target. I guess it could be asked why is staff retention uh, important to ECIC? Uh, being a niche export credit agency, it becomes imperative for the corporation to be able to retain its highly skilled insurance professionals that we have. Thank you, Chen. Thanks, CE. Thank you to our head of HR. Then the other target is the percentage of business processes automated. I think the Overall high objective, we want to become less paperless, become more paperless company. And we have a target to automate about 70% of our business processes. 
I think as at quarter two, we automated up to 50% of those processes. In terms of outlook to year end, we're on track to meet that target of 70%. Then another different target that we have, we track employee, employee costs to end premium, which is the end premium, which is a three year average. And the target here is 31%. Um, but as at quarter one, we're sitting at 5%, then in quarter two, we're sitting at 9%. I think what this does demonstrate is that the employee costs, the budget, the operating budget that goes to employees is very small as a ratio of the premium end by, by the business. So we're not overly worried about issues of efficiency at this stage or being a bloated entity. Being a, an insurance company, the issue of risk management is critical to, it's a success factor for the, for the entity. I think uh, working with the risk committee of the board, we've developed risk limits so that when we face new transactions, both at the transactional level, also at a sector level and at a country level, we have limits. So when we face new transactions, we consider them within these risk limits. So we have a framework that's been formally adopted and we are not in breach of these risk appetite limits to date. Obviously the nature of our business does lend itself to high concentration risk because there's fewer transactions. And we do have reserves that we raise just to reflect when the business is overly concentrated, it may show up in the financial statements because we hold higher reserves. Also, the other focus is on the risk maturity levels within the corporation across all staff, across all the different areas of operations. We obviously want to maintain higher levels of risk maturity. However, to date, like I said, this is an annual target. We'll be conducting that survey in quarter four. So to date, we cannot talk about any variance at this stage. The next target is about capital growth. So here we track the increase in our equity capital. The target being that we should increase annually the equity base by 5%. We can report that in quarter one, there was a reduction in the equity wave of 1%. And this was largely due to negative returns on investment portfolio. I think the Russia-Ukraine scenario, the overall negative inflation environment globally. Most of the asset classes suffered losses and that had a knock-on effect on the, in our financial results where the capital growth showed a negative growth of 1%. Nonetheless, there was a, an improvement in quarter two where now we started showing an increase of 1.7%. And I think uh, as the CFO was reflecting, the investment income is improving in quarter three and we project that there would be further improvements in quarter four. That being said, we have had to raise other provisions for potential claim, which has a, an impact obviously on the final standing of our capital growth by year end. In terms of the operating costs now, which includes employee costs and other costs, and um, we also track that. We used to have a ratio on this one, but I think more recently we agreed on a specific number, target number, which was agreed with the board. And for this financial year, we've agreed that we want to keep our operating costs at 150 million rands. So by quarter one, we had um, incurred up to 29 million rands. But quarter two, it was 62 million rands, rounding off at 63. As you can see, we are still within the threshold, well within that. And we project that by year end, we should be within that capped cost. I think here the focus is to have a focus mind within the corporation to ensure that we also manage the cost side of the business, not only chasing the income, but also making sure that we deliver the objectives which are developmental in nature but on an efficient basis okay the other target relates to 
corporate reputation index. Essentially here we run a survey to existing stakeholders, which in, yeah, it's an every three year exercise we do. We run a survey uh, to stakeholders. This includes government, other financial institutions that use the ECIC insurance paper, exporters, other, you know, other stakeholders within society. And this is an independent survey, and then it kicks out a score. The target here was 70%. We just seen the results earlier this week. In fact, those results have kicked out a score of 77%. So it seems that we are well received within the constituencies that we're targeting to interact with. Then there's another one, which is the culture entropy score. It's also an internally focused study, which looks at the corporate culture in the organization, because there's a saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast, whilst we very clear on strategies. We want also to make sure that our people engagement side of the business is still at a proper level so that even like people talk about new employees, succession plans, new people, or even retaining existing skills, but have a very inclusive culture within the corporation that will build excellence and be able to deliver given the complexity of our business and the high risk nature of our business. This is critical to our staff retention to be able to track these various elements. The other one is about external audit results. Again, this one will only be determined after year end, but from past history, we've been getting clean audits. So again, we do not anticipate that there would be changes in this area, but obviously we are always focused because each year is new and based on the internal controls being effective, we should then be able to repeat the outcomes that we've been able to achieve in the past. The CEO, you have, 11, uh, you have 11 slides left, and I wondered if you could uh, deal with those 11 slides in, te in 10 minutes to take us up to half past so that we have 30 minutes for questions and answers, uh, just so that you then manage how you deal with each slide then uh, going forward for the rest of the time. My apologies for the time crunch. No, thanks, Chair. I'll try my best. I'll try. I think here, we, what we show is from a project cycle, we, we track projects that were approved in a particular year, but we also track those projects that were previously approved, which now have reached a stage where they start to draw down and exports are taking place. So through these three sets of slides in quarter one, we do show that we supported at least five projects which were drawing up to 566 million US, I mean, 56 million rands. And these projects resulted, move to the next slides. The jobs that were achieved through these projects by quarter one, during the construction phase is about 2,744 and in the operational phase, 337 jobs. And we give a breakdown in terms of the sectors that benefited from, from, from the interventions that were made. So I think that's important. Obviously, the way we track this, we track the value of drawdowns, but also the value of essay content containing those drawdowns. Sometimes there's a time lag difference between the two. That's why in some tables you might see the essay content number is higher than the actual drawdown number. It's because there's a time lag between the recording and verification of the essay content number, which may create that discrepancy on a quarter to quarter basis. But if you look at it holistically, the SA content number will always be smaller than the export secured. So those are the quarter one numbers. We can then jump straight to the slide that shows quarter two numbers. Yes, as at quarter two, a different number of projects benefited. I think here there were three projects, but the overall benefit here was much higher because they were drawing much higher numbers. But in terms of jobs, there were 3,278 during construction and about 411 during the operational phase of the project. 
Okay, yeah, this slide talks generally to what are the initiatives that uh, we're embarking upon to assist our exporters to take advantage of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. As we've mentioned earlier on, ECC mandate has since been expanded to cover now not only capital goods exports, but to cover consumer goods exports. And this lends us to supporting short-term insurance business, that is transactions with the loan term of less than two years. Obviously, there are existing private sector players who are involved in this space, who, who credit guarantee, Lombards and many others. I think the intention here is to complement them to the extent there are market gaps and the certain countries which are considered high risk, for example, Zimbabwe and other countries, Sudan and many other jurisdictions of the African continent, we're able then to fill the market gap by having this offering. Secondly, we have a specific partnership with the IDC, which is a sister institution to us. And as I've indicated earlier on, they bring a different solution to the table, they're able to provide actual lending. When we partner with them, then we can provide the total solution of lending and insurance. So we have a facility of 55 million US dollars, which has been agreed between us and them. And their target market here is for smaller export transactions. Um, so again, this facility has been you know, created with the intention to boost uh, access to finance for exporters in order to take advantage of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Over and above that, we have then the Export Passport Program, which is additional to the inter africa Trade Facility. I've already touched on the program and its purposes. This is a partnership now with all these DTI entities, DTIC itself is the motherboard, ECIC, IDC, and NEF. Again, here, there's a particular focus to deal with emerging exporters, but not to the exclusion of established exporters. Then, uh, obviously, as part of our general work, we have ongoing collaboration with the commercial banks and then the development finance institutions. By development finance institutions, I include here, I've already mentioned the IDC, but I include here the DBSA as well. So we work quite closely with the DBSA as well. And this is then to give our exporters and the buyers of South African goods and services access to finance. Because the nature of international competition, you, ex you compete on the technical aspects of your offering, but also on the funding package that you can put in front of a buyer, international buyer. So working with the banks is critical. Working with the DFIs is critical. It helps our exporters really to compete on the continent and, and enable them then to expand the geographic footprint. I think in countries such as West Africa, East Africa, not only just the Sadak region. I think that is the end goal is to expand that geographic footprint much further. We are also a shareholder in Africa Bank, and as part of that, we have concluded a collaboration cooperation agreement with them. And the advantage we take is that we also co-finance with them, also with with SA banks transactions on the continent, which makes sure that the projects that we support can access full funding. But also there's a risk sharing because then South Africa doesn't take all the risk in some of these difficult jurisdictions. So some of the risk can be shared through co-financing, but also through a guarantee scheme. We have an agreement with African Bank that where we are overly concentrated, we can buy guarantee support from them as part of this partnership. And I think this became quite relevant in Mozambique in one of the big projects that we're supporting there, which is the Moz LNG gas project, which at the moment is still on hold, but indeed that kind of support can be replicated to other transactions across the continent. And we met with Africa and Bank yesterday, they're quite keen for us to continue this partnership. Just taking stock where we are as of now, the value of deals approved to date, we're sitting at 308 million US dollars, which in rent terms translates to about 5.5 .5 billion rents. I think when you look at this in rent terms, it gives you a sense of to what extent are we leveraging our capital to achieve impact for South Africa. Because if you look at our equity capital base, somewhere around six to seven billion, 
but already on an annual basis, we're able to leverage transactions to that value close to 6 billion. But if we add now the hospital transactions, which is under negotiation, we we'll most probably get to 7 billion and above. That I thought is important for the committee to understand mm -hmm. when we look at these targets to see how stretched are they. Our sense is that these are indeed are stretched targets given the size of the balance sheet of the entity. But I think um, our head of actuarial and investments did show the risk systems that are in place from a capital base and capital solvency position that we do this on a responsible basis. In terms of deals approved to date, under the old mandate, we're sitting at two. The target is four. We're working on chasing that target by year end. Value of deals approved under the expanded mandate, currently we're sitting at 8.2 million US dollars against a target of 60. On this part, yes, we're making progress, but slowly. But there are some other deals which are under consideration in quarter four. Hopefully those will help us to bridge the gap. As regards the export passport program, we're still um, pushing very hard, working closely with the DTIC to bring on board our partners, IDC and F to conclude on this, on this program and start rolling it out in quarter four still. Thank you, Chair. I think that concludes the presentation to give you enough time to engage with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, CEO. Members, uh, can I take hands for interaction, discussion, clarity, suggestions? Members? We have been lost members on their way to parliament. Um, can I take hands from members? Unless you're saying you have absolutely no questions for, for the CEO and his team. It would, it would appear so, Che. It would appear as if the the presentation needs no discussion. While we are waiting for members to indicate, if I may just uh, raise a question, the members will uh, join me in asking questions. So you previously in, 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 um, in your engagements with the, with the committee, you, you said that you, would review and amend the Export Credit and Foreign Investments Insurance Act, Insurance Act. If you can indicate to us if there's any any um, any progress in this regard, and also about the expansion of your mandate, uh, how has this impacted the operations of the entity? And then let me hand over to Honourable Burns Namashe. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chair. I think uh, um, it's, it's proper to welcome uh, the report, I mean, the presentation rather, by the CEO. And um, perhaps uh, one question that cuts across almost all entities is about uh, the outreach uh, program, uh, including the commodities uh, that um, they look at as part of the uh, export participants. For instance, if you go to the Eastern Cape, uh, there's a lot of citrus in the agricultural sector. Um, I'm not sure whether they do consider uh, such commodities which are agricultural in nature, including um, export uh, on the part of um, uh, beef and uh, 
other consumables. Um, uh, 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 also appreciate the fact that um, they support uh, the businesses that have been supported through the TFIs, whether it's ITC or NEF. But in that regard, I did not hear him making mention of CIFA. I know CIFA is an entity of small business, uh, but um, um, obviously we, there's a symbiotic relationship uh, between the mandate of uh, DTIC and that of uh, small business, uh, development of small business, uh, because those people, I mean, it, 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 they, they, they have, they, there's a way in which there's a relationship between a uh, small business and those who are classified as industrialists. So I want to check whether they also uh, take into account uh, those that are CIFA funded. Yeah, so those are the two things, uh, Chair. Um, and thank you very much. CEO, it seems like those are the only questions. Oh, I see Honorable Mbiani saying, Honorable Mbiani. Thanks, Chair. Oh, mine was just uh, at least similar to, to the one of uh, CT. Just uh, checking the program of uh, awareness and education. Do they have it mm. uh, in all our our provinces? Uh, then, for sure, the question of the uh, uh, assisting in terms of the black. How do they know them? Do they have regional uh, offices? or not, how do they communicate with the masses so that they they are known from the masses? And so, so check with them in terms of whether there's any partnership uh, with IDC and NAF and how does it image the, the impact that it does on the ground? Uh, maybe they can also clarify more on the uh, uh, cross-border investment. They spoke of cross-border investment. Maybe those are, are some of the questions that I had, more especially the bridge, the paid bridge, Masina. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Mbiani. Over to you, CEO, and to you and your team, obviously. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you to the Honorable members for the I think here at some point so some work was done and legislation but implementing the trade strategy. I think it was felt by our time to be able to respond. And the focus was more on collaboration between entities like IDC and FSIC, including Safe of the NEDA program. Those are specific initiatives. Okay fostering more closer collaboration between the different interim approach to that. So the exam bank thing has been shelved. So that legislative uh, program also has specific legislative given that uh, for to the extent they provide 
provide funding to support your exports. So to be taken to the South African export market. If Engagement must still take place at the departmental level. In terms of the operations, indeed, uh, being authorized now it changes from the one where there was a new business unit called short term trade finance from the private sector to join us. They put some of the delay in rolling out the actual transactions. So that we want to do it in a way that meets market. We know that this line of business tends to be high risk. So we have to have all the to make sure that what venturing, making a leap into the dark. So all to the company so that when we naturally it means the marketing strategy is much were able to support now, which we're not able to do so Outreach, um, we don't have of the financial institutions. Some of this financial in the different provinces. So, through the business standard, the banks, the commercial deals, then they will come and talk to us. But we, we do have a Business development team, which is an in house team. Council per sector, but whether you know, in the different we go and present to them the large.
In fact, one of the things we're discussing is exactly strategy to make sure that the, the, there's also online platforms, which I think uh, online platforms may in remote areas, but I still value the human touch. So indeed, we will be, you know, making inroads. South Africa, uh, propagating the new mandate that we've been given. Um, there was a question on cross border investment. I think great road for export products that links. of goods and people as part of this the efficient but that was on the Zimbabwe side of the but I think now it is exposed so that there's a seamless movement what do one make that the efficiency of movement is, is, is and as you know, Zimbabwe is an important neighbor and in terms of the trade flows, it's a big trade is Zambia, Tanzania, and they did they do enhance intra Africa trade. Thanks. Thank you very much, say, oh, Yes, indeed. Um, I noticed the chair's hand. Let me take you, Chair. Chair, thanks so much. I just want to add one key point. I think it comes around your question around the expansion mandate. Uh, one of the key initiatives that the management team have been working quite uh, hard with the DTIC and the Minister's office is to include euro policies. So currently as an organization, all of the political risk cover and project risk cover that we sign off for exports is done in US dollars. And there's a major need within the continent and for the South African banks to, to have a euro currency product. So all of the work has been done and our understanding from the minister's office is the use of euro policies, which will definitely help support our exports. Just wanted to add Thank on that. Thank you very much. Thank you so um, much. Yes, as I was saying, the uh, we had first-hand experience as the portfolio committee when we did oversight with customs at uh, the Bait Breach border post, you know, where we saw uh, physically saw the, 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 the inefficiencies of trucks being parked and then drivers having to walk uh, for a few minutes up the hill to go and produce their documents. So I think we all need to put our heads together to make sure that we have efficient uh, border posts for the movement of goods, which would of course um, facilitate uh, the trade in the AFC FTA, which is what we are working towards. Um, in closing, I note that the, 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 that as an entity that you have been performing well, um, I think that we must continue to engage with you. If we are saying that we, 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 we want to facilitate, facilitate uh, trade. We need to meet with you more often uh, because I, I, it's a very long time since we've uh, met with the entity. And also to look at, um, at, at having a discussion around the review and amendment of the, of the legislation. 
let me end there and thank you very much for coming to the committee. If there are any questions you feel needs to be further expanded on, feel free to submit it in the writing to the, um, to the secretariat of the committee. Thank you very much for your attendance and for your report to this committee. Thanks, Chair, and thanks all on the members. Thank you. Can I just check with the, with the, the committee secretary for announcements? Um, Chairperson, just two announcements. The next meeting is on the 21st of February. We will have an engagement with the South African Bureau of Standards around the, on the, around the Kin and Run strategy. And then on 22nd, Chair, we have a briefing by the IDC and the NEF on its first quarter and second quarter financial and non-financial performance for the 2022-23 financial year. Um, I have received correspondence from the chairperson of the IDC, but I will brief you on the matter when we have our engagement later, Chair. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, members, for this uh, rather long first meeting of the year. Um, mm -hmm. I know that uh, we all in a rush now on our way to parliament for the sitting. Thank you very much to everyone on the platform. Goodbye. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Long live, Chair. Long live, Chair.